only a few weeks ago, BT has changed its pricing policy. You know, now that's not necessarily to say that was all down to hyperoptic. But that added would, to the pressure. That would be disingenuous and yeah, hyperbolic. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, we do, we certainly added to the pressure. We lobbied in exactly the right places and we were able to make a real difference. Moving into Vorbos and seeing that they had a similar principle of no mid-contract price rises, even though it's business. And people would say, ah, but business customers, they read every word of a contract. They're much more astute. There isn't a harm. It's not necessarily that there's a harm. It's that... It's just really terrible business practice that reflects that you're not very good at managing your revenue stream. Hello and welcome to another telecoms.com podcast. On this filthy day for weather, spring keeps toying with us. Well, it's supposed to be better in the afternoon. Right, well, fucking can't be much worse. So, um... But, but we're indoors now, and I'm going to do that usual thing of not burying the lead with our special guest, because sometimes I'll go into like talking bollocks for about 10 minutes, and everyone's going, who's that geezer who's just like commenting every now and then? Um, we do have a special guest, uh, someone I've known for years, Howard Jones, a PR person. Duh, duh, duh. Indeed. We do have PR people on every now and then. Um, and Howard, I must have known you for about... 15 years. About 15 years, Scott, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I first met you two jobs ago when I was working at a tech blog called Hexus. And I started, and I decided to focus on mobile chips. This was about 2007, seven, eight, when it was obvious that smartphones were a big deal. And Hexus was um, a chip-focused one, but more like PC chips, like AMD and, mm. and Intel and all that. Mm. And I thought, wow, well, you know, and also there was um, two English companies that were very prominent in that space that I only learned about in that job, which was Arm and Imagination Technologies. So I thought I'd focus on that. And this is at a time when Qualcomm um, had just launched a Snapdragon then. Yeah. And you were working with another um, favorite of the pod, Elena from right. um, Liberty. Yeah. You were working at Liberty and that's when I met you. Indeed. I was representing Qualcomm in Europe. Uh, yeah. Interesting to feel how far ago that was. Yeah. Um, when I joined that team, one of the primary concerns from Qualcomm was was the threat of Intel. And, right. and, and yeah. that felt very real at the time. And now that feels almost ludicrous. I tell you, right? this isn't in any way to self-aggrandize or to belittle what you said. It didn't feel real to me. No. Ah, because I was... Because um, <laughs> you knew. Well, yeah, you because knew. they... Well, because it was simple. I didn't know that much, but I did know that the whole reason that ARM was successful over as a as an instruction set, as a microarchitecture over x86, which is microarchitecture mm -hmm. in Intel and AMD, was because of um, energy efficiency. So that's fine in servers and in PCs with fans. Mm -hmm. You're not so worried about heat. But obviously, you know, as Samsung discovered once, you don't want phones getting all hot in I'm, your pocket. I'm, I'm not sure that the first bit's right anymore. What's that? With the, with the, that's okay in servers. And, no, no, you're right. Yeah, uh, over time, I think that's changing. But I mean, back I, then, Amazon and all these guys are now making their stuff with ARM-based stuff. It's no, totally. The RAN. No, so, in fact, I remember chatting to ARM back then yeah. when I was wearing my Hexus hat, and and then I don't know if he's still there, but their marketing director going, "You watch us, we're getting into servers." Yeah. So well, yeah, it's no, taken a long time, but I think that's more to do with building an ecosystem. I mean, energy efficiency is never bad. But yeah. anyway, Intel had this, um, you know, they always have their code names. Like a lot of their chips now have got some, named after some lake for some reason. Ice right? Lake is, yeah. Ice Lake's one that I wrote about with Samsung, actually. There we right. go. But this, okay. like, the, the latest one's Granite Rapids, I think, on the RAM side. All right, so they like yeah. some things vaguely aquatic um, <laughs> for some reason. Um, you know, if, if, they, if it's a really shit product, I'll probably call it a stream or something. Yeah. Um, and they came out with this chip that was just called Moore's Town. So maybe the fact they're naming that after even a stream was was portentous and yeah and it was just far too hot okay um and so it's interesting that qualcomm were worried about them and obviously as a you know as a very powerful significant and resourceful um, innovative company they're right to be worried about them but even to me then as the relative novice i was on this matter i thought how, how can they how can they be in smartphones when their chips like no, pound for pound use up so much a, more energy it's a fair shout i think the other the other thing to say at that point in time, NVIDIA was considered quite a niche player. Yeah. Mm. And, and you know, if you just, just look at that turnaround. Yeah, yeah. The, well, the, indeed. the trajectory they, they've been on since Pierre, that point. Pierre cries himself yeah. to sleep at night about the NVIDIA stocks he doesn't own. You do as well. <laughs> I think we all do, don't <laughs> we? Yeah. 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 Who doesn't? If I felt that was ever realistic, I would also yeah. cry about not owning NVIDIA stocks. Yeah. Although, what's yeah. more annoying is like, I've got a few, I've got a few quid in, in just sort of like funds. 
you know, manage funds and that sort of thing. And I think these people who are all city boys who've got tons of money and, and get enormous commissions, how come I haven't got any NVIDIA in any of those? I mean, you know, in hindsight, and hindsight's yeah. always twenty twenty. you know, the AI thing, I guess... They play it safe, don't they? That's the whole thing about those funds. Yeah, but they'll, they'll invest in some volatile stuff like Tesla or whatever, and they probably dabbled in, in, in... Yeah, it's probably a tiny little bit of what you, yeah. of what you have. That... I mean, in hindsight, as soon as, like, ChatGPT came out, mm. people who knew what they were doing should have just gone all in on video, shouldn't they? But then... Yeah, well, they, everybody, yeah, exactly. Everybody says that about something. Yeah. Everybody really knows yeah. it's going to take off. So. so have I known you longer than Scott then even? Yeah. Because I, I first yeah. met oh. Howard when I was at Telecommunications Magazine with yeah. Ken Wheeland, and that yeah. was like 2006. And yeah. you, you were with Brian Dolby, I think. Yeah, that's right. Time. I was uh, working up so in Nottingham at, at BCS. It? Yeah, that's right. Oh, that's right. Wow. So that was your gig before Liberty? That's right. Uh, so lived in Nottingham and uh, started off just temping at this this PR agency happened to be run by a guy called Brian Dolby who because of the Nottingham connection to Marconi he was the global head of comms at Marconi before that collapsed is this and, sound guy Dolby no, sorry. Uh, he's not the sound guy no he's, he loves he loves he loves an interview though he really does yeah um, you're gonna have to raise the level of your jokes if you're gonna he, butt in from now on <laughs> And because of him, Nottingham, bizarrely enough, had this um, specialist telecoms PR agency. Right. And that's where... So telecoms was not by any means a yeah, choice. Yeah. No, it was no. just something that happened to me. And 20 years later... Yeah, well, I'm, same I'm here. I mean, you know still in you I know how I got this gig because we're, we're both friends with Mike Hibbard, who yeah. was the, the predecessor. Yeah. Uh, I don't think any writers or PR people go into it by choice, do they? You don't Well, someone like Richard Fogg, who, who went to Bournemouth University and, and did, did PR and stuff, they, they're career PR people. You can do a degree in PR. Oh, yeah, but I mean the actual can. subject matter the subject, itself. Yeah. Oh, the subject matter. I mean, yeah, a lot yeah, of people totally. want to be journalists, but they don't want to be telecom journalists. Yeah. No. You, know, you want to write politics or, or, or write in war zones sport. and be like a hero or write about sport, Absolutely. actually. And I think yeah. in our respective careers, you are expected to, for some reason to have a passion, an innate passion for the thing that you talk about. Yeah. And mm. I, I don't really believe that that's true very well, yeah, often. Yeah, we have I no passion we, at all. We're just, bur we're just burdened with a lot of knowledge and experience. We should write about beer. You can't really escape. Yeah. No, I, I, I feel I've become more passionate about telecom as, as my as things have gone, which is a quite a good position to be in, I suppose, when you're sort of 50 to be more interested in it than I think I'll let was you know. 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. But I think I'm, I, I find it quite interesting, yeah. the issues. Well, I, it's become more geopolitical as well recently. Yeah. Well, so, and another thing I think um, about it is, given that the more obscure and unsexy the subject matter, the, the more jobs there are likely to be and the more money there's likely to be, because that just seems to be the way of things. Like, you know, there's probably countless journalists who want to get into sport or yeah. or fashion or, or even current affairs, whereas whereas there's less of a stampede to get into telecom. So yeah. you could say that, that that creates opportunities for us. But I say, if you're going to write like B2B journalism about a certain geeky area, we could do a lot worse than telecom. Well, I think the only, the only interesting ones on. are, are, are tech and, and telecom. Really. Yeah. Because well, telecom, I think, even though it sometimes gets derided as being a utility, I don't think it is really. No, it's we somewhere could be writing about oil and gas or something it's, like that. It's quite adjacent to tech, I think. So, yeah, um, very I much. agree. The only, the only thing that doesn't stand that point up to be yeah. true is, is, in general, the share prices. Yeah. And I think we would all yeah. agree that there is a that's more. That's more of the utility side. Absolutely. Of it, yeah. There's a huge disconnect between the role that... Uh, the everyday person on the street sees telecom play in their life, whether they actually see it, but they, yeah. it, I guarantee the role that it plays in mm. their life is significant. And the work that we all know collectively goes into it is vast and worthy of share prices that are far greater than they are right now. And it's very yeah. hard, I think, to explain that significant disconnect. Well, we might, yeah. we might ask you to, because uh, among, along your, your meandering but largely telecoms-focused career mm -hmm. path since where we just left it off, You've uh, worked at both EE and Vodafone, so uh, maybe you'll be able to shed some light on that. But before we get into the more substantial stuff, and obviously talk about what your gig is now, which is a company called Vorbos, which I'll invite you to tell us about in a bit. Thank you. But um, but we do tend to talk a little bit of bollocks before we get into it. And and actually, you, you provided um, one little bit of material for some bollocks to talk about, which is about a day ago. You put a post on LinkedIn. I don't go to LinkedIn that much. I should probably do it more. It's becoming more of an actual it's all right. social media site rather than well, it's, it's just a, it's a an online CV. Communicating with people It's very useful, but also I think as people migrate away from X, if not completely, certainly to some extent, I think I think LinkedIn is a place they want to hang out a bit more. Um, yeah. And therefore, the content does go a little bit beyond just the dry and professional, Yeah, which makes it a bit more entertaining. So, um, yeah, and... And you put up something which I think, to some degree, typifies how 
it it's taking on more of a general social media tone rather than you know corporate chess beating and like oh I'm so excited to have won shiny <laughs> fucker of the year award or whatever. Um, and uh, and so I'm just going to read out your post if that's all right. Oh, by the way, while I, while I'm slightly embarrassing you, I've got to call you out for forgetting to bring beers, <sighs> which uh, which as, as someone who I've got drunk with many times and who's someone who works in PR is a uh, is pretty I'm, shocking. I'm mortified. Will I? <laughs> really, the crux of my job and my career is providing drinks. Which you know, that's I, really the nub of it. There's a, <laughs> there's a lot of nuance around that, but the nub of it is ensuring that everybody is is well provided for in that regard. Yeah. And to have turned up at a podcast and, and and neglected to bring drinks when that's and we're having to, to give you beers. I mean that's You've just wrong, given isn't me it? Beers, which it, I think but this might be the first time that's ever happened. So, so that's we, so that's like we might be drinking four each then today, yeah. Scott. Ah, yeah. uh, we got spares. We got plenty. Oh. By the way, you should, you should be grateful. But I'm sorry anyway to everybody. You should be grateful. I'm sorry. Whichever camera I'm on, I'm sorry. All right. Yeah, you got your own yeah. camera there. Yeah, yeah. Um, you should be grateful that we're not inflicting things like this. Well, I think we should inflict it. On yeah, no. Oh, that's, that's a good one. Though. He's only little. Oh no, it wouldn't be. No, he's up for it. No, he's far above my weight in some regards. Well, I'll stick it in there. Look. Is it tastes... called Hercules? Hazy Hercules? Yeah, look at it. Goodness me, it's 9.5%. Yeah, exactly. That, that's why I'm not going to flip that on you. Oh, you got to go. Well, You'll we'll be spilling all the ice. football secrets. I think, it'll, I think it'll need chilling, though. Goodness yeah. me. Right. Yeah. Let's do it. 9.5% and room temperature is a recipe for disaster. He's game. Well, that more than makes up for your oversight. <laughs> that's, your, that's your forfeit, isn't My it? My forfeit. Um, it's fair. It's only fair. Yeah. Um... Anyway, and so, uh, yeah, so we've got this um, thing that you put up on LinkedIn and you just said, uh, you put in quotes, Afternoon, Howard, I understand you might be busy. That's perfectly fine. However, I dot, dot, dot. And then you ask yourself, who's in the wrong here? Him for the astonishing, pres astonishingly presumptuous tone in his unsolicited sales emails. Um, um, or me for not replying to his first few unsolicited sales emails and being cross about this one, or him for making me cross. And then you finish off by saying, I mean, perfectly fine, Christ. Um, and, and so I think it's an interesting point because we all get those emails. God, as I'm sure you can Which imagine. Upset someone, obviously. I mean, you know, something that I get yeah. a lot of, and I'm sure you're only too aware of, of, the, of the genre, is the, the generic PR emails. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I sometimes get ones that, that even like, get my name wrong or my title wrong. Um, which I think is particularly, sometimes I share them, don't I? What I won't ever do, which is something I used to do, you know, um, there's a, a Facebook group called Tech Journalists and PR. Absolutely, yeah. Which yeah. I haven't actively used since it, some people on it attempted to cancel me um, years ago, including one cat woman who wrote a story in the Inquirer about me. Mm. Um, but she looked like cat woman. No, she's a, a woman who had lots of cats. That's what I mean by cat woman. Oh, that's that's less appealing. <laughs> which which I think perhaps unfairly sometimes you can deduce other things about them if they surround themselves with cats anyway. Um and uh yeah. And 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 that's that site always ended up I thought that that community always ended up degenerating into quite toxic stuff it's which to was That's what I was going to use. It's toxic. Yeah, and and it's generally fueled <clears throat> by sort of pre-bidona journalists going having a go at PRs for pitching them. Which I thought was unfair. I mean, granted, a lot of pitches I think are clumsy and unspecific um, and all that. But you know, just ignore them. Don't, don't fucking throw your toys out there, yeah. Pram. Um, but uh, so this reminds me of that. But yeah, you're one there. You know, I understand you might be busy. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. Wait, what? It's what a redundant <clears throat> thing to say. No, actually, I'm a complete dosser. Well, and also, it's not as though I in any way invited this conversation. Yeah. You know, this guy's emailed me out of the blue with an offer that is not relevant to me. Yeah. Now, it could have been relevant to me, so he's not wrong to contact me in the first instance. Yeah. Of course, that's but it's a perfectly position, reasonable what, thing. Which iteration but, of his so thing do you think this was? This was the third. Yeah. Which, again, is fine, and perhaps it's my fault for not replying. Perhaps <clears throat> I should well, be more You can't more reply polite. to every bit of spam. Huh? Well, no, you can't, because no, no matter how much you say, uh, no thanks, excuse me, <clears throat> no matter how much you say, no thanks, they will find a reason to come back again. You're on the hook. Yeah, yeah. So salesy type emails, you know, are, are a bit of a pain. Mm. And it is my fault for getting cross because to your <laughs> point about complaining about pitches, I should have just gone, this, no, is, but not, I'm pleased you put this is not very good and therefore I will just... I mean, you weren't that cross. It's not like you wrote a really fine. sanctimonious, don't you know how fucking busy I am I type of thing. I didn't name and shame him either. As well. So, I mean, I think it's fine. Form. I just treat it as an interesting, like, talking point. <laughs> and, and so there is something 
slightly passive aggressive of I understand you might be busy. And that's his way of going, that's why you haven't got back to me yet, yeah. isn't it? Are we, we're assuming him, their their way of going. It is him. Oh, okay, I can right. confirm that. Um, and as you say, and that's yeah. perfectly fine. Oh, cheers. Yeah, is thanks for, for you know allowing me to yeah. be too busy to reply to the email that I didn't um, ever want in the first instance. Anyway, I thought that was a fun little there's, one. There's a good about. correlation to PR, though, because the, 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 the standard generally of pitching in PR is quite low, I think. And I think in I telecoms, think so. we kind of have the luxury of being a small enough industry to get to know each other reasonably well and that overcomes the barriers but i do think there is there's there's a, a lot of people that will they'll pitch everything like it's the best story in the world yeah and i think that, that you, they lose credibility from day one yeah and actually there's a lot to be said for recognizing that a lot of what pr firms put out is just very run-of-the-mill very yeah. ordinary but it still has a place being put out. It's no criticism to send it in, but it isn't the greatest story in the world. Mm. And sort of boy who cried wolf stuff. You know, if you say every story is great, the one time you do have a great well, story, totally, and there'll yeah, be one every agree. few years if you're lucky, yeah. then no one's gonna no one's gonna well, believe then, you, and that's a real shame. And that also feeds into the relationship building side of it, um, which is something I've ranted about plenty of times on the, on the pod before. Not least because. Um, I value relationship building in that it normally involves free alcohol for me. Um, but, you know, if if you're, you know, like agencies, two agencies you've worked at that, that I'm still very close to and they do do this well, Liberty, we mentioned before, mm. CC Group. CC Group, yeah. Um, you know, they get to know us. Yeah, it does involve a bit of free alcohol, but, you know, I, d I think we're a fairly cheap day, aren't we? Um, Don't you know, about that. A few pints and a Nando's. <laughs> That's a bunch <laughs> and of I'm any ones. Um, and uh, some old fashioned, <laughs> yeah. Um, but but then but then they can you know then you can advise and, and then it works if if it's the like the more permanent people like the owners of the agency or the senior people at the agency they can then percolate that down because it's quite a high churn agency side it's quite a high churn isn't it? Um, uh, yeah, I mean I think the better the agent the agency the lower the churn. Yes, indeed you would assume. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, but you know even like the best agencies I, oh. I can think of. Uh, very few people who've been there apart from the owners since I started. Um, I can think of one or two at CC, but not that many. Anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, but then they can percolate that down and they can go, look, you know, you know, I, I always assume and perhaps slightly flatter myself that PRs have sort of files on journalists and they can go, look, this bloke, there's no point in just sending speculative shit to him. Or they might have someone, I won't name him, but we all know who I'm talking about. You might have these real prima donna journalists that where you go, well, careful. Because if you get I the pitch wrong there, files, it'll throw toys out the pram. Yeah, I think they. they have some I, I'm not kind of, saying do, all of them. Generally, do, do, do PRs, whether it's in-house or agency, I, have some I, kind of like goodness. database on us. Um, the, the database I have is like that bri is, minimum bribe level is firmly in my head. Right, but that yeah. probably speaks yeah, more I mean, to my to organizational extent. capabilities yeah. ra rather than anything else. But yeah, I've got a good sense um, to a point of what what will fly with with what journalists in inside our sector gets more interesting when you try and branch out of that sector for the occasional story things get a bit trickier then you're into the unknown and then you've got to fall back on just having you know good basics get the principles right um don't and, and ultimately yes you want success but but you really don't want to be that guy that messaged me and actually put me in a position where i actively wouldn't use his company. yeah yeah. That's the worst outcome well, of any. That's the fine pitch. line, Whether isn't it's it? It's a, a cold sales email or a PR pitch. If if you if you offend somebody to the point where they actually think worse of you for a harmless pitch, do you need another beer? I will do shortly. But okay, I'll get you one. Yeah. So carry on. Um, me to then, then you know, <laughs> rather than rudely uh, sorted oh, out worry. me and Ian, and not you. Then uh, you know that's a, that's a real fail on your part. You certainly no. Should you want to give him that one? You that's not cold yet. <laughs> Don't worry. That's Let me have a warm up. That's next. Let me have a warm up. I just want to watch someone drink it, really. Yeah. And how is that person? <laughs> yeah, could I'm, we, I'm happy could to. we get a bucket or something? <laughs> I don't. Oh, come on. You know me better than I don't that. think it's going to be that bad. Just, just uh, but yeah, there is, there is an informal file of, yeah. like, of knowledge on, on a journalist and... You know, I mean, I mean, I would imagine CC Group has the same thing. Not not necessarily like written stuff on on us, but they they will know like Ian's more likely to be interested in this Thank stuff. Scott's more likely to be interested in this stuff. With that, the, the national press guy, who I wouldn't know, but I know some of their names. But he's going to be covering this, or she's going to be covering that, or whatever. So without a doubt, yeah. And you um, know, uh, 
the excellent and in our industry university known Ray Lamaitre. You know, when I first started, Ray was a guy. Even though you were told to phone everybody, which is terrible advice, really. In mm. hindsight, but well, I just phone, I stopped picking to, up my phone about you, five you, years ago. You're told to phone everybody. The guy I would never actually phone. <laughs> It's Ray. It's Ray. Ray. Really? But yeah. He's nice to PR people. Yeah, but I, he'll, he'll I ask. Know, maybe he's nice. I mean, he's, I mean, he's one of the loveliest men I've ever met. But I don't. I, uh, Twenty years ago, when I first started, I, bearing in mind the story was not worth phoning in. Exactly. You right. know what I can imagine Ray doing was, while he while he's a nice guy. Him. He's also quite yeah. forensic and quite direct. Mm. Yeah. And and he he probably just mm. go so, you know, just ask some simple Socratic like why why do I care. Yeah. type of stuff and then you're like because blah, blah, you're not sure but I, but the one that strikes me as being quite difficult to deal with from by his own sort of admission so i don't actually feel bad bringing him up is alan burkett gray he sort of regularly puts up on social media that he's been hassled by pr mm. people and i mean he's, he's kind of semi-retired i think now alan yeah, but, he, yeah, yeah. but he would regularly put up on twitter and stuff that he'd been hassled by the like group um, he was uh, yeah by hassled by these pr people and don't bother in the run-up you know two weeks before which i agree with by the way don't bother in two weeks before a mobile world okay. live but it, but you got the Congress. feeling that he was actually sort of being quite aggressive to young people sort of phoning and going i don't know what i'm doing here help uh, me out but, absolutely you know but uh, you know to to flip that so because I, the, of where i started uh my boss had a great relationship with alan and uh Alan then was extremely kind to me as right. a stupid okay. 23-year-old. Right. Fair that enough. Right. But he wasn't kind to the people who hadn't been given that introduction. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, you know, he did, I think, call out bad behaviour too often. He was partly responsible for some of the toxicity in that group. He was one of many. It wasn't him by, alone by any means. But there, there is definitely an, an unhealthy relationship. We're mm. all just trying to get along, right? We're all just... Yeah. And, and ideally... Uh, Really, you know, idealistic view. A comms person makes a journalist's life easier and better, mm. helps them get to a better result more quickly. But I'll give you actually, That's a lovely way I'll of blow, thinking um, about things. You know? Having having named and shamed you um, yeah. for your for your lack of beers, I'll blow a bit of smoke up your ass. When I not long after I'd started at telecoms.com and we were still at Mortimer House, mm. just like four offices ago, yeah. um, I and I think so. You were at EE then. Yep. And I remember, you know, your, your professional self-interest was clear, but you spent a lot of time educating me on certain things like, you know, the different spectrum properties and, and like the, the more physics-y stuff that I didn't know because I wasn't, I wasn't a telecoms guy before this. I was just a more general tech guy. Um, and I think that presumably didn't do you any harm professionally, but it certainly helped me. So, yeah, that's a classic. That, that's one more thing on, on this tangent that I wanted to mention before we, before we get off it. Um, last time we all met up and we had a bite to eat, mm -hmm. um, we we spoke a little bit ago. about yeah, like <laughs> a good two or three weeks ago, uh, where at, at some stage I went, Howard, why don't you come on a fucking pod? And here you are. Yeah. Um, uh, we spoke a little bit about you know talking about PR best practice. We talk, spoke a little bit about what I call PR dark arts, mm -hmm. which sounds actually more sinister than it is. It's just, I think, just more subtle PR. Absolutely. Um, and you know, and just. Yeah, stuff like obviously whining and dining and and schmoozing, getting to know people, but also just um, advising, you know, having off the record conversations. You know, it, it can be as sneaky as you want, and I'm sure you can go and some, in some areas, maybe in like politics or something, they get real dark. But yeah, that just doesn't seem to happen very much, and and this is you know this is no one's fault. I just don't often get compared to even like ten or fifteen years ago. I just don't get that many people going, Scott, you know, just you might find this interesting, have a little chat, just the more. It's a real shame because to me, that's the essence of what we do. And that's the point of the relationship is to get to a point where there's a level of trust where, um, you know, that that off the record conversation is useful for both parties. Yeah. And I think to some extent, <clears throat> it's the comms person's duty to recognise that if the out the outcome doesn't have to be explicitly good for them. In order for it to be a good, or it doesn't outcome. have to be transactional there and then. It does not. Have you to be can take the longer view. Absolutely right. The longer view is is crucial. Add value. If you just if you just go generally uh, about your work with a with a principle of adding value to yeah. the journalists around you, then you can't really go very far wrong. And actually, then if you live your life that way professionally, then actually 
you start to become a useful resource for people. Indeed. And that it then should be a can, symbiotic be, relationship. can be far beyond what your actual day job is representing your company or the companies if you're if your agency side. You become gen, generally useful in the industry. Who wouldn't want to be generally useful? And they're in, for what they're being paid for. I think that's a lovely yeah. place to get to. And it's, again, it comes back to that idea. It's a lovely way to think about Certainly what my we do. Yeah, you'll get there. <laughs> you know, you will, Maybe. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> but that whole idea of, you know, ultimately a comms person should be trying to make a journalist's yeah, yeah. life easier and better and I, I, just by getting to the, the right or the best solution more quickly. One of my working theories for why this is diminishing as a yeah, bit of best practice is um, that, you know, back to the t phrase I used a minute ago, transactional, I think corporates, PR outcomes are a lot harder to measure. And especially Great. now, since in the internet age where marketing outcomes, with everything being digital, you can you can geek out on stats almost infinitely. Yeah. Whereas PR outcomes are qualitative, not quantitative, and, and that's a lot harder to measure. And I think often companies just, if you can't see it in a simple spreadsheet that you can then pass up the food chain, well, they, they can, find it harder to justify. There's a bit of that. They can measure how many stories have been written based on the press release that came out. You know, well, how there we are, but, the, but to Howard's yeah. point about being more generally useful in the longer term, yeah. that's especially hard to measure. Extremely hard to measure. So that's one. Imme immeasurable. Yeah. Right. So that's one of my theories about why. It, yeah, the number of data points in PR by comparison to the number of data points in marketing is, is in an enormous difference. There, there are um, there are working groups in the PR world that spend an inordinate amount of time trying to establish agreed measurement principles. Um, frankly, I don't think anything has landed that's really right. good enough it's yet. It's really comprehensive stuff. yet. Right. Not sure if it ever really will because I do think it's quite it's 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 quite a difficult transient topic. But ultimately, what they're trying to do is give themselves a seat at the a commercial seat at the board, right? Where they want to be able to say, my function is worth this much yes. to the business. And actually, I think a lot of what we do takes a bit of trust, a bit of faith. Yeah, that's a, in, I agree. In, in straightened times, that's a tough thing to lean back and on. It's, it's the easier thing right? to salami slice out. Absolutely. Yeah. If all you can go on is a bit of faith that, you know, this, this, this team or person is important to you, that's quite a tough place to be. I'd hold that that's true, but it does require a little bit of, yeah, a little yeah. bit of faith. Yeah, no, that, yeah. that's totally consistent. But with what I think. for your point about what, why, why the 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 more subtle side of PR is in decline, seemingly from what you're experiencing, um, I'd find that very hard to explain because it's generally an experience thing, and there are no fewer experienced PR folks around now than there were 15 years ago. Indeed, um, inexperience clearly there's a lack of relationship, there's a lack for a lack of trust. Therefore, yeah. you know, and we've all dealt with little all sort of uh, yeah. uh, junior account execs and, and yeah. bless them. Who were you know, just out of uni. And yeah. tell you what, if they are enthusiastically picking up the phone or arranging to meet with you, then they will go far. Yeah. The quality of the interaction might not be great by comparison to agency founders with 25 years experience. But if attitudinally, if they're picking up the phone and taking you out for lunch and spending time with you and getting to know who you are, they will go far. In 20 years, they will be dominating the industry. Indeed. Because so do you think they're, un and, and that doesn't happen that much. It could just be me. Yeah. It could be that everyone else is being taken out to lunch all the time and I'm just considered <laughs> such toxic social company. A pariah. Um, but um, but I, I wonder whether they're given the incentives to do it, whether they're given the budget, whether whether they they're ex like 90% of their time is just spent doing the more um, repetitive, spammy stuff or whatever. Anyway, I we've mean, become quite lazy as an industry, you know, uh, find a story, write the press release, send it out, report the coverage, repeat. Yeah, indeed. And actually, that is quite dull. And if that's, that's all only that one there thing. is, yeah, if that's all that there is, then, it's, you know, yeah. for, for any, any good comms person, it's going to get very bored of that very quickly. But I, I think There's the, a lot more to it than that. I think that it's um, a, a dual thing. I think on the other side of the fence, on the on the, on the the journalism side, I think there's a, there's a certain amount of guilt there as well. For Yeah, I, I don't think that the quality of a lot of coverage these days is... is yeah, yeah, I hear you. I think there's a lot of bad trade journalism around. I agree, and I think there's um, there's a requirement to write a certain number of stories in a day. Yep, you have very underfunded, yeah. under-resourced exactly. titles where it just seems that the the publisher all you, all they want is you picking up a bunch of press releases mm. and, and and sort of editing them essentially, yeah. and there's very little kind of original reporting. Because if you're on, massively so. up against it, 
and you're under resourced and your targets are really aggressive if you get sent five decent press releases that day that's five yeah. stories but so and job actually, done. It, just job, turn it around job done. Yeah. it's it's Where's quite depressing the, in the u.s yeah. because i know from um liaisons with kind of US colleagues over there that I think some of the big companies over there that we deal with and I wouldn't, wouldn't name them specifically now because what, what I'm about to say will probably upset them but they I've heard they sort of regard the trade press as you just do all you guys sort of almost do marketing for us you know we yeah. put that press release whereas well, that's the guys true of a lot really of political press in the states that we have to worry about where someone might write something that we have to go and sort of do some firefighting and that's the wall street journal and the new york times so when this colleague of mine was writing stuff that was more kind of like raising some questions he was he was like what, what, what what's this going, yeah, yeah. what's going on here it was that yeah. sort of uh, impression and the sad thing is trade journalism shouldn't be like that. if you go back to the sort of you know, 19, 1910s, 1920s, that whole sort of, the whole standard oil thing, the person who kind of instigated that on the kind of, in the journalism world was Ida Tarbuck. And she was, do, right. she was a trade journalist. She was just right. covering oil for a very specific publication. Yeah. It's obviously a long time ago. It's back in the days of, you know, magazines and probably six monthly editions or whatever. <laughs> but she was, yeah. you know, the book she wrote on standard oil is regarded as like one of the kind of high, high points of, mm. Take, trade a, journalism take a more right? recent example, you know, not to praise one of your competitors, but Computer Weekly and their role in the post office scandal. Well, they're not. They're, they're not, not shy about talking about they're it. Not a competitor <laughs> anyway. Well, yeah. yes, so of course. We're merging yeah. with Tech Target. Yeah. No, yeah. but I think that's very a great exciting move for, for you yeah. both. No, we yeah. spoke yeah. about um, that exact thing on the pod, and I thought that was great. And it was just one journalist who just was allowed to go down the rabbit hole. Yeah. And just speak to people. Yeah. And she obviously credit to her. She did a great job of and, doing it. And I'm not saying things like that don't happen at all, but I just think there's less. There's certainly less of that because that was quite in-depth and went on for quite a while. But even just sort of proper following up and yeah. and, and I've got yeah. an idea about something and that this should be it and I'm going to go out and, and yeah. hassle a few people rather than press releases come in and we just respond yeah. to them. Because the more that the, the journalists just feed off press releases coming in and you respond to them, the more it's just going to feed behaviour by the PR to just sort of... So, be, so, be so, so sort of mutually... So it's a mutual um, thing. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. You know, and one of the problems is that proper journalism is quite expensive. Yeah. You know, you could spend a it week really on one is. story. Well, you could spend a week on one story, or you could turn around five press releases in a day. Yeah. Um, and and the re and the reason why it being expensive is especially difficult is again the internet's fault because ever since the internet came along, most media spend is hoovered up by Google and Facebook and a few other um, in, uh, internet giants. Yeah. Uh, and tons of money has been taken out of actual media companies. Yeah. So that's an issue as well. I've got a couple of other things. Um, that I want to quickly mention before we move on. Talking about proper journalism, your successor at EE, Howard. Yes. A bloke called Alex Jackman. Yeah, lovely guy. And uh, he's a good lad. Smart guy. And, like uh, and he, doesn't, he doesn't mind buying us a beer or two. So uh, yeah. good journalist, Pat Pat. <laughs> um, and, uh, and he listened to last week's pod. And last week's pod, um, I'd just come back from a weekend in Venice. And I was bitching about my roaming experience. I'm on EE, right. as you'll know, because I was on EE when you were yeah. there. Um, I was on EE and 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 it mos it mostly roamed to Vodafone Italia, which had me on edge, believe it or not, okay. fucking two and a half G or whatever. Yeah, um, surprise it's still around. And uh, yeah, do you know what I mean? And so I went I went bitch moan uh, and all that sort of thing. And anyway, and then and he went off and he went you know no under they're flogging it. He went like half <laughs> half jokingly. He sort of went, oh great, thanks for that. <laughs> yeah. Because whenever this stuff comes up on the pod, I guess it's a PR person's job, even if I'm saying it in a very throwaway way. It's, you know, it's reputation yeah. management, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so he went, uh, let me look into it. And then he got back to me today um, and uh, and basically said that the roaming agreement in Italy that he has is primarily a telecom Italia with a backup with Iliad. And I think I remember saying Iliad was the second best. Mm. And so I'd, I'd be on 5G with, with Tim, I'd be on 4G with Iliad, I'd be on HSPA Plus with Wintray, and I'd be on Bollocks with Vodafone. And and I was aggrieved because I was on Vodafone most of the time. I'm, I'm not sure about Telecom Italia's branding as Tim. It's a bit of a, a wimpy name, isn't I it, know. really? Well, it's just an abbreviation. Yes, I know, but they should have realised that... The English people, <laughs> that's a bloke's name. And it's also that, it's, it kind of brings, brings back sort of um, Monty Python. Yeah, yeah. Know? The wizard, um, the warlock. <laughs> exactly. Well, Tim. I can't hear the name Tim without thinking of that. <laughs> warlock. So. Um, and, uh, and anyway, and he said that. Um, and, um, and he goes, uh, so basically, you know, that their primary agreements with that, and, and it only falls back onto other stuff when you can't get onto the primary ones. Yeah. So, 
so that's his way of, you know, in terms of reputation management, that's his way of going, it's not our fucking fault. Uh, we would have had you on Tim if, if there was Tim available. And, and obviously I believe him. Um, and I suppose it's good that there is a cascade and it falls down to even the shittest one. Yeah. Um, but the only thing I find weird is I was either not on Tim at all or I was on Tim 5G, which is counterintuitive. I don't get why it didn't fall back onto lesser sort of versions of, of Tim. Mm. Um, it's just still making you laugh, me saying Tim, isn't it? Lesser versions of Tim. Yes. That's, um, so, genius, so, yeah, but fair play to Alex for getting back to me. Yeah. Um, and I'm happy to... Uh, to sort of clear uh, to correct the record on that, um, that they do go there first, but for some reason, basically he's saying it's Tim's fault. So I don't know if this is causing another diplomatic incident now Bloody Tim, between E yeah. and Tim. They're going to go, "Hey, why the fuck are you talking about?" Or something like that. That's, that's, that's your first accent, Italian one yeah, yeah. that you've ever done. Um, yes, uh, it's interesting that you're choosing not to blame Vodafone Italia. For being shit. Oh, I did. Well, I covered that comprehensively oh, on the last pod. Yeah, no, I definitely really? moaned about that. In which case, that. everyone's had their fair share. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and Vodafone in, in any form hasn't chosen to um, pick up on it, I guess, because Vodafone in the UK, like Jamie, um, it's not his problem because he's UK. It's, Vodafone won't get upset about it because it's fast web now, isn't it? Yeah. So, mm. is it is it gone through yet? Or, I, don't know. I don't know if it's gone through, but yeah. Um, and one last, thing I, branding level. one last thing I want to no. say before I hand over to Pierre for him to tell us who our city of the month is, is I've got one bit of feedback on your LinkedIn post, which I think is worth flagging up. From someone called Andy Jones. <laughs> yeah, well, we know we know him. He's an analyst. He's an analyst. Well, he also He's calls him, events, yeah. he also calls himself telecom industry thought leader. I'll be the He's, judge of that, Andy. He's, um, he's, he's pretty good. He's, he's pretty good. good. He's, he's, right. bright. he's a bright guy. He's, he's yeah. bright. Okay. Well, he, all right. But I mean, you know, thought leader. That's a fucking bold claim. As far <laughs> I'm going. He's not leading my thoughts. Um. Anyway, and he goes in response to what you wrote. He goes. He goes, you find this guy's presumptuous tone offensive? I happen to find your profane and blasphemous choice of expletives offensive. <laughs> it's like, all right. Is that almost a Welsh accent? Uh, it's just a, it's supposed to be a sort of supercilious, sort of slightly haughty. <laughs> but it Easily did, offended. It, yeah, exactly. It straight into some... Sort it could of, have been. Yeah, Welsh um, I think. Anyway, I, just, I, I always find it funny when people <laughs> give... You know, Howard sings obviously a little bit tongue-in-cheek. It's a bit playful. Okay. He's, just, he's just bunged it up there for a bit of a giggle. And for this guy Andy to to be so sort of haughty in response, well, maybe, I maybe he was hilarious. maybe he was being um, ironic. Perhaps he it was. Just doesn't come through. In I the suppose comments. it was. He did say after that he said each to his own. I suppose exclamation mark. So he, I, he so he's making a point about you know I think horses for horses and all that. I sort think of he's thing. having a laugh. He, all right. Well, if you are Andy, I take it back. <laughs> I don't know him personally, but I suspect he's a good egg. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Well, and you, you obviously don't want to piss him off, um, <laughs> or you'll lay some thought leadership. Not without no, of course. He'll, he could lead thoughts He'll against lead your me. thoughts. He'll lay yeah. some psychic vibes on yeah. you. Okay. All right. That's lots of bollocks that has just been spoken. So, Pierre, that, have, have we you got finished any? now? We've finished the bollocks. That's about half an hour of fucking bollocks, that was. I'll yeah. just I cut mean, it all out. People yeah. will complain, Scott. At well, least we'll, it was we'll very relevant it. to telecom. Yeah, yeah, no. It was, it was stuff that I was going to get into later on anyway. That's topic one. Don't yeah, that's topic one. Okay. okay. Pierre, who's uh, place uh, of the month? Seat of the month. Uh, we should have been drinking some Guinnesses. Ah, ah Dublin. Dublin, yes, excellent, that's right. Um, I'm that's not gonna still a, f- a pod I remember fondly with uh, me and Jamie um, mm. speaking to Niall Norton in in a pub in mm. Dublin. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and then uh, yeah, I want to give a shout out to what's his name, Raymond Kassar, an avid listener of the pod, who gave a, a oh nice yeah, he comment. said nice things on LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah. What did he say? Have you got it? There? Uh, just something nice. Like, just something nice. I, I like I like to dwell on on compliments. <laughs> I don't I don't take compliments for granted. No, it's all right. You don't need to read it out. It's cool. Okay. All right. Jolly good. So, um, Howard, why don't we? So, as as we've been over a fair bit in the in the fairly lengthy yes, the lengthy lengthy bullshit. Bit, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, you've been all over the place. Um, and yeah. you are in a sort of structured and strategic fashion. No, no, yeah, no doubt. You know. I'm not in any way trying to imply that, that you, there's a sort of Brownian motion aspect to your career trajectory. Um, and you're now a company called Vorboss, which That's I've right. got to admit, no offense to Vorboss, I wasn't very familiar with till you got there. You've obviously corrected that. Of course, that's um, my But yeah. for our audience um, who might not be familiar with it, why don't you just start by giving us the elevator pitch on Vorboss? Sure. So uh, Vorboss um, provides business internet to um, enterprises in London. And its proposition is very much um, premium offer in terms of performance. So very new infrastructure. Only started building in 2019. It's got its own fibre. 
built its built all its own fiber right. using the regulatory change to PIA that happened in 2019, allowing opening up OpenReach's ducts and poles right. remember that. to ducks scale poles. deployment from 2019 onwards. That allowed our founder um, and CEO Tim Kresic to be able to transition the business from a um, uh, an MSP that was using OpenReach infrastructure to uh, its own fiber network. Okay. So, so are you in the same sort of market as Neos Networks, a company that I wrote about this week? As it happens, similar market in the yep. sense in the sense of providing high end connectivity to enterprise. Right. We'd say we go further in terms of the the the, the newness and therefore quality of the network. No legacy equipment. They are, they are called Neos yeah. though. Oh, that's true. So you're newer than uh, Neos. And newer, even that's newer. pretty fucking. Um, that's, that's the headline. And <laughs> what's newer than Neos? And the uh, <laughs> And the, the proposition is very much, uh, so 10 gig, 25 gig, 100 gig. Right. They're the three speed tariffs that we do. So you can see straight away going after that, um, the more demanding business end of the market. Yep. Um, and very targeted on the London geography. So right. we cover all of zone one, most of zone two, filtering occasionally into zone three where there's real customer demand for right. it. Right. So, so like famously, like um, traders and city boys want a really good connection absolutely. for all their... Yeah, yeah. Micro trading. Yeah, anywhere that has, that has a really high requirement for reliability, security, bandwidth. Right. You know, those are the really so the banks key is things. A, is a, banks is, is a big, big, one. big market. Yeah. But I think probably contrary to the impression I've created around it being a very premium and high-end product, the pricing is extremely competitive and very transparent. So, you know, really competitive on the, the front, the upfront number, but actually... We'll do a 12-month contract rather than locking people in for three years. Right. And at the end of that 12 months, the price won't go up. Right. And there's no mid-contract price rise. So really differentiated that in was, terms that was of a, that. That was a big bit of messaging in your last job, wasn't it? It was. Mid-contract price rise is, is something that I have. last job was a place called Hyperoptic. Yeah, I was at Hyperoptic. Way, and um, it, we, were, we were very big on pushing the the consumer harm, the real consumer harm done by mid-contract price rises. Delighted to say we were a driving force behind government and Ofcom reviewing and, and the ASA through, through you know, looking at looking at the way in which this whole space is governed and regulated. And now look, only a few weeks ago, BT has changed its pricing policy. You know, now that's not necessarily to say that was all down to hyperoptic. But that added would, to the pressure. That would be disingenuous and yeah. hyperbolic. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, we do, we certainly added to the pressure. We lobbied in exactly the right places, and we were able to make a real difference. Moving into Vorbos and seeing that they had a similar principle of no mid contract price rises, even though it's business, and people would say, ah, but business customers they read every word of a contract. They're much more astute. There isn't a harm. It's not necessarily that there's a harm. It's that. It's just really terrible business practice that reflects that you're not very good at managing your revenue streams. Mm. And actually, it belies yeah. the fact that, you know, the, the, the price of bandwidth will fall quicker than inflation. And really, you should be able to manage that. Totally. And it, it's, it feels like, I mean, it feels like bad faith. Absolutely. Like, I thought we had a fucking contract. Co to find me an individual outside of telecoms who believes that a contract does not equate to the price staying the same. Exactly. There is, there is, there is, th those people who have convinced themselves that it's okay have just drunk all of the Kool Aid and, and agreed to lie to themselves. Yeah. Although and that I, must I be do, a fun experience. I do have some sympathy you know. for operators wanting to increase prices. And actually, Neos, the, so the interview I did with, so Neos, um, you, you're aware of, yeah. obviously, but is a, a company in the fiber market, it made a bit of a noise a couple of years ago. It's owned by SSC Group and Infra mm. Capital, sort of 50 50. But they went on a big kind of uh, fiber build out spree and did a lot of BT exchange unbundling. And um, it's been quite expensive. I mean, they've kind of yeah, had yeah. some losses and they're now trying to, you know, um, turn, turn a profit basically and actually build business. But they don't want to. The CEO who I spoke to, the new CEO, and he came in in sort of October, I think. He's mm. like, we we don't want to get involved in a kind of race to the bottom on pricing because then it kind of ruins the market. And I, th I, I think that's the concern, isn't it? There's like so much fibre competition now. And Scott and I talk about this all the time. The industry is not in a great, none of, none of the different sectors in the telecom industry in a great place. And it's like, I have some sympathy with operators wanting to, you know, I, who was it? It was the BT CEO, actually, who was saying, he had a bit of a bad rap in the FT, obviously, in his last few months. and Didn't he just? Yeah. Oh, Christ, what's his name? Philip Janssen. Yeah. yeah. So Philip Janssen was saying, you know, basically what people are, what we're asking them to spend is like a pound a day for something that's dead important. 
Mm. And now that was on an investor call. You, you wouldn't have said that probably in a no. meeting with customers where they're complaining about price rises. But it's kind of a fair point. It's like, I don't, I don't feel that we pay very much compared to a lot of other the markets for connectivity. I, I and, think and, connectivity, yeah. and we've kind of drifted into a consumer space. And obviously, I'm, today, I, I have the luxury of being very business focused. But the consumer, the value that consumers are getting from the telecom industry as a whole, whether it's mobile or fixed, is absolutely fantastic. That does not Especially mean... Especially in Europe, compared to absolutely. States, for example. Yeah. The US probably has got it about right. And I think, um, you know, it would be great for the Euro big European telcos if they could yeah. charge what the US guys are charging. But I don't think the US are, are out of whack at all. I don't think it's expensive. I think right. it's about right. So it's about but... $50. I checked at and T's things mm. recently. On, this is mobile, so it's mm. not <clears throat> where you are in. But at and yeah. on mobile is about $50 a month average. And what's the exchange rate? So that's about 35 quid. No, a bit more, it's than, more that. than that. It's yeah, So Orange, quid. which I just looked at as a kind of random yeah. example of a, of a you know, a Western telco in France, by the way, yeah. is 21 euros. Yeah. So it's big difference. Big difference. And, and I don't for a second dispute that it is great value. Does being great value give you the right to behave really badly? Mm. Yeah, yeah. I'm not no, sure that, it does. Yeah. If you want your prices to be higher, increase your prices. But isn't that you know, the... up front, front well, book, I think this whole inflation plus 3.9% exactly. malarkey was very dodgy, actually. Extremely. That whole, that and that's, what's, thing, that's yeah. what's gone. That's, what, that's yeah. what we lobbied against in my old job. That's what we were successful in achieving the, the change. BT is now extremely clear about its mid-contract price rise. Yes. It, it, I can't remember the exact details, but effectively, by service, it increases by a pounds and pence am amount per per month. Yeah, fine, absolute transparency. I could, uh, I'd still argue that a contract is a contract, and that yeah. should indicate a fixed price. But hey, we're not going to change the world. We've at least got rid of inflation plus, which was a fairly abhorrent tactic when it came yeah, to ripping off that. consumers. Yeah. So I think that's a really good step forward. And that was presumably, inflation plus was probably their way of smuggling in uh, a real terms um, price increase and just saying Absolutely. it's an inflation adjustment. Well, let's, let's take the example where imagine we had inflation below 3.9 or even negative inflation. What do you think they charge? They just charge 3.9. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, so let's not would. kid ourselves. They, they, they do. That's the policy. Yeah, yeah. In, sorry, old world yeah. when it was 3.9 plus, yeah. inflation plus 3.9, they would just charge you at least 3.9. Mm. Yeah. So it's it's a total fallacy to say it's to do with increasing costs because their costs could decrease and they would still put it up by, by 3.9. Yeah. But I, but I have, the behavior is abhorrent. But I, have, I think the problem yeah. is... Um, because they, I think we talked about this before we came on, because they sort of sometimes get lumped in with that utility. Um, yeah, there are a bunch of utilities and yeah. everybody's always up in arms when, um, well, maybe they're, not, maybe they're not up in arms as much as they should be, but there've been a lot of price rises by utilities obviously mm -hmm. going on in the last couple of years. My, I don't know about you, but my water rates went up quite a lot. My, I think everybody's electricity and gas bills went up massively, obviously a couple of years ago with the yeah. all the disruption in Ukraine and everything. and. Worst ones, car and insurance, like, fucking yeah. double this year. And, and yet, yeah. um, I, I sort of feel in in a way, I mean, they're not good services, by the way, are they, generally speaking? I don't think anybody would say they're really happy about the way that Thames Waters run. It's an absolute disaster, to be honest with you. And yet, I mean, I turn the tap on, water comes out. What else? Yeah. Is gonna... and, and, I'd like to be able to swim in the sea. And yeah, I think the telecom story is has been quite successful. I mean, I don't live it. I, I, I'm living in a fairly landlocked county right. in Surrey, but... but, but you've we're heard. Like, were I to go to the sea, my gut feel is I'll oh. be a bit ginger about getting yeah. in. Interesting, you know? interesting uh, <laughs> term you use, gut feel. But, <laughs> but I feel the, the the telecom sort of the story of telecom over the last sort of forty years, if you like, since the kind of since kind of like deregulation started to happen, yeah. has been. And I know we moan a lot at the moment about the state of the industry and it's not doing very well, but it's actually been a. I mean, Labour's talking about renationalising rail. I noticed at the moment, and I have less sort of resistance to that idea in a sense because it's a sort of natural monopoly and probably yeah. hasn't done very well under privatization than yeah. the old Corbyn idea of nationalizing broadband where you think the story of, of, of deregulation in telecom has actually been a real success story I think yes. you look at where we are now compared to the old days of you know BT when you know you used to pay to do a long distance call and I remember yeah, yeah. my dad having a go at my sister all the time because she'd been on the phone with her boyfriend in Leeds or something and it cost a fortune just because it was a phone call to Leeds from the home counties and you know, yeah. whereas now it's like cheap and ubiquitous. It's mobile. It's it's broad, but they've they've Absolutely. advanced so much. Whereas the water and the gas companies haven't 
not changed at all. What they do is exactly the same. That's why I resist the kind of comparison with utilities. I, I completely agree. There is, the comparison to utilities is really harmful for the telco industry, does it a disservice, but I think fundamentally if they were to be regulated like the utilities, that would things would get even more challenging. Which they're working <clears throat> towards doing in the States again. Yeah, and that's a, you know, title two or yeah, whatever it's called. Yeah, and it's an interesting direction of travel. But I, I don't disagree for a second that what we get in the UK and across Europe is absolutely phenomenal value for the for the service quality and capability we receive. Um, prices should probably be higher in order to yeah. ensure that investment can continue and that actually telecoms can be an industry that 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 drives innovation, because I think we are astonishingly dependent upon the infrastructure that they build um, in every every facet of our lives. So that they get beaten up all the time is, it's a rough gig. Mm. My standpoint would be find a transparent way to raise your prices. Yeah. And, so, and, and then I, you know. So yeah. isn't this the problem? Haven't No queries. It, aren't they in a, um, so I should, actually I just, just occurred to me that um, you were at Vodafone and you were responsible for a previous podcast stalwart no longer being here because you're the one who, who nicked Jamie off us, weren't you? That's correct. Yeah. I did. I ruthlessly, when I joined Vodafone in 2020, I, I knew. So I'd been very network and technology focused at my time at EE and then via acquisition in, into BT. Um, and when I moved to Vodafone and took on a sort of broader role looking after the corporate technology and consumer brief there, um, I didn't want to get burdened down with with the burn with the technology side of things particularly because that can be a bit of an inhibitor to getting stuck into the bigger picture stuff so mm -hmm. I, I wanted a guy who knew is or a person rather who knew their technology stuff and uh and was also going to be very capable for with, with the written word and would be able to have great journalist relationships and yeah the excellent James then you fell back on yeah, jamie yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he wasn't available settled, settled for jamie. <laughs> Uh, Bring up Jamie. He was a great hire. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, we were extremely bright. Guy. I remember saying lots of times, and perhaps, yeah. perhaps slightly condescending to Jamie, yeah. which I didn't mean that way. But lots of times after, when we were dealing with him as a PR, I was like, God, he's he's quite good. He's good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. he's really yeah. good. Super bright and uh, just gets it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but um, but yeah, the reason I, I mentioned Vodafone as well is you are obviously you know very well positioned as an insider to to talk about this stuff. And, and one thing I wanted to propose to you, I think you're quite right to call out sly price increases, but yeah. isn't one of the reasons they do it? Because they're in some kind of um, sort of catch-22 situation where it's such a competitive env uh, environment. It is so commoditized. I know they're not a utility in the same way that water or energy is, but it, in some way, it's viewed by some people as a commodity. And I can imagine when they're shopping around, yeah. they go to price comparison sites and it's very price sensitive. Yeah. And and obviously, you know, we four companies, even if, they, even if it wasn't illegal, would find it hard to operate as a cartel, i.e. all raise their prices at the same time. So... That aren't they in a no-win situation? Isn't it impossible for them to pr raise their prices in the current market environment? Well, there needs to be M and A, doesn't there, Scott? Well, that that could be one thing. Yeah, in fact, we'll, we'll get onto that in a sec as well. Yeah, although um, although I can assure you, raised prices will not be a product of that particular piece of M and A activity you're alluding to, because that would, of course, play into the hands of of the doubters. Yeah, the this is Vodafone say, three to anyone who hasn't joined yeah, the dots. Sorry, apologies. Yeah, Vodafone three is a, pen, a pending and potential merger. If we look back to 2015, 2016, when it was 02 and 03, you know, one of the driving forces behind the 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 quashing of that potential acquisition, it was an acquisition rather than a merger, but the acquisition yeah. then was the belief that moving from four to three in the mobile market would create price increases for, for consumers. And I think, you know, you've got to look back at the history of the regulator being in that <coughs> period of time and the CMA being extremely consumer centric and extremely focused on pricing yeah. and question whether that's been good for the industry at large. And I think probably we'd, we'd have to find that it hasn't, hasn't been good for the industry at large. That that acquisition would have probably changed the game for the UK mobile market and created three healthier players. Yeah. Whether it goes so far as to fix the systemic issues mm. that we see today, and and you know the, the the challenge between being an everyday, legitimately vital service 
but having a share price that's rubbish. Yeah. You know, whether it would go so far as to fix that, I don't think any of us know, and I think probably the answer is no. Yeah. But certainly it would have moved things in the right direction, just as just as the Vodafone 3 merger would move things in the right direction. But funnily well, enough... Not according to the CMO. Not according well, to the CMO. Well, let's uh, put a pin in yeah, that, because yeah. that's going to be an actual segment. Yeah, of course. In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say one thing, and then I'm going to invite you, Andrew, I'm going to bring the conversation back to Vorbus. I mean, just to... Just to remember, the reason we went off on this tangent is we were comparing the sort of B2B to the consumer market. Mm. But I'll, I'll bring it back to that in a sec. I just want to flag up one thing. I, I was actually just looking up um, an email exchange between you and me, and I looked at my inbox. And back to the PR stuff. I'm not going to name the the individual or the company. I'm not going to embarrass them. It's a minor little fuck up. But it, but it is quite typical of what sometimes we get as incoming. So a person sent a thing saying, hi, Scott, regarding this redacted, 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 let me know if it was of interest to you. And so this was sent today. And I went, hi, name redacted. It was link to story we wrote two days ago about that very thing. And so there's a minor delay and they came back and went, oh, you know, apologies, I missed it. Thanks for the great piece. And obviously they're, they're a bit embarrassed. But what what I think is, you know, and obviously I wouldn't dream of naming and shaming the person. It's just, to me, when I received it, <laughs> Ian's trying to have a look. Don't you dare say anything. Um, <laughs> when I received it, it just said that this is a generic thing. They've just sent it out almost as a matter of course. They can't have looked at the site to see if we covered it was, before was, they sent it. Is that it. on the topic of security by any chance? I'm not going to say because I don't, I don't want to be um, well, that's, indiscreet. Well, that's a pretty broad subject. I don't think that narrows it down for anybody to guess what it's about. Um, it sort of is, yeah. Yeah. I know, I know what you're um, talking about. And uh, yeah, anyway, I just thought I'd flag that. that that's yeah, an yeah. example of one of those little things. You know, if I it, feel it, bad for that person, though. Yeah, I do. And, and I didn't give them a hard time. Be, no, no. And you've been very, you, you've been kind in your email and you've been kind in not, not naming and shaming now, as I know you never would. But they are kicking themselves. Yeah. I they bet. really are. I bet. They are kicking themselves. But I, I find that quite common, <laughs> to yeah. be honest. I, yeah. I, I, I often get sort of. Not often, yeah. but every now and again, you get an email saying, would you find this interesting? And it's like, well, yeah, I wrote about it a week yeah, ago. Exactly. Um, and I usually don't respond it, to it, these emails, it, by the way. It's, um, no. And I just, I just, my, general, my general sort of modus operandi with PR, I think. No, I, 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 I probably don't reply to a lot of them. I just thought I would. And again, didn't, didn't want to go do your fucking job or something really aggressive like that. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, that thought, a bit hard. I thought I might yeah. just go, yeah, yeah, we wrote about it. Don't yeah. you read telecoms.com um, daily? I know. Well, that's the thing. If I wanted to get butt hurt, it, it would imply that they couldn't be bothered to have a cursory look at my otherwise yeah. exemplary website. Anyway, um, back to Vorboss. So, yeah, yeah we, we went off on one. You, you're giving us the, the, the top, as we do. Um, so, yeah. I think I facilitated that. It's fine. Don't worry. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. so do you find... The, the B2B, and, you know, having been at EE and Vodafone, very much B2C, although they've, they've obviously got B2B yep. arms. Yeah. Do you find these, whereas Hyperoptics was, no, actually, was that B2C more? So Hyperoptics about, you know, yeah, predominantly consumer. Consumer, right. But some business. So actually. how are you finding this this move into a, a 100% a pure play B2B? Is, is it a very different market, very different it's, dynamics? Um, yeah. The, 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 I mean, do you know what? In terms of what appeals to the customer, arguably no. Um, it isn't that different. Um, but what's great is the ability to be targeted. Um, EE and then into BT and then Vodafone, less so hyperoptic, but those three brands, you know, th they would structure their businesses in such a way that any anybody spending money on telecoms had to be a potential customer. So they would orient all of their the propositions and products around capturing as much of the available market share as they possibly could. Now that doesn't sound like a bad strategy, right? But actually, if it if it means that you're largely unfocused, that you do everything for everybody, then really there's there's going to be a quality ceiling because you can't do everything for everybody. Yeah, everything you really, everywhere. You really can't. You can't do everything everywhere. No, as it was when I joined. You never do you everything. Know, everything. Yeah. Uh, I remember taking the piss out of that name when it I, first came out. I was I, like, Hexus. In about 2010, I think I, t I tweeted, this is this is doomed to failure. And then two years later, <laughs> joined the company. And I was I went back and frantically fucking delete, 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 delete. delete. <laughs> Whew, oh. Got away with it. Uh, yeah, I, I remember but, I, wrote, but, I wrote a sort of tongue piece name. for Hexus going, I'd love to be in the room where they said it. I said, all right, what, what are we good at? We're... Well, we're good at quite a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, and uh, and where do we do it? Well, quite a lot of places. No, let's take it further. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I've had some fun with that story. Uh, I agree. And actually, it speaks, with the game. terrible name aside, uh, uh, you know, what became the flagship 
uh, part of the telco telco environment in the UK, in my opinion. Um, bad naming origins, but that whole desire to capture every piece of the market available to you, I don't really believe leads to best practice in any way. And so to be somewhere where we are highly targeted, it is demanding businesses in London. That's our customer base. And actually, you know, our CEO firmly believes that, that based on the trajectory of, of growth of data demand and based on the architecture that we've built, that you know, there's a, there's an opportunity to have as many as half of all of London's businesses connecting via Vorbos right. within this decade, because it's a uniquely it's a unique proposition. The, the 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 capacity capability is so high, the infrastructure is to such a high standard, the security is so good. Actually, the whole the whole wrap is extremely. So there's no appealing. one else doing because that's one thing I was going to ask about is um, in the UK. There's there's been a bit of a gold rush for fiber. Mm. There's, you know, there's there's obviously open reach. There's um, there's Virgin Media O2, which has started doing a wholesale yeah, thing. Next fiber, there's City yeah. Fiber. Yeah. There's other companies like um, Hyperoptic and, and other people we've had on the pod. Jarleth from uh, Open Net was it Open Net? Jarleth. No, G- is it Giga Net. Giga Net. No, Open Net. Alliance. Yeah. Alliance okay. Net. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, um, Jarleth's people. If you, it's been a while since he came, when he brought us bottles of Irish whiskey, when he came. Oh, so, it just so gets worse. Yeah. I'll and he's not even a PR. I'll put something in the post. Um, he, uh, yeah. He's welcome on. He you don't have to bring yeah. Irish whiskey, by the way. Yeah, it's all points fibre. All points fibre, yes. and, um, and Ronan from Madtrans just joined they're that, quite, they're, much, they're a reasonably big deal now, I think, all points fibre. Yeah. Because, and they've got like a really good um, hire with Ronan. Cause yeah, yeah. Madtrans, yeah. He's a good CTO. We had, that was one of the more techie pods we've had when we had Ronan on because he yeah. fucking knows this stuff like I the can back imagine. of his hand. And he would do a fantastic job of what I'm about to butcher, which is that okay. one of the fundamental differences between what you've articulated there. Everyone he, who talks about there has effectively built a PON network. Passive optical yeah. network. That that's what they've that's what they've built. Your, your the, point to point. Excuse right? me for the tautology of the of the N, but passive optical yeah, network yeah. is not a pond network. It's like pin so, number. Yeah, exactly. Um, what an idiot. But uh, <laughs> the 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 architecture is very different to what we've built, which is a direct internet access network. So it's like a point-to-point point rather point than point. a point-to-multiple. So I actually exactly. don't understand the difference in these two things. Well, Who wants to, to take this? So I think shared bandwidth. Take this. Hmm? It goes in, it's shared bandwidth. Shared bandwidth. It, it, goes into, it goes into a splitter and it gets split between several houses. A pond does. Yeah. yeah. Right. So whereas what what Volbos would do is Just direct, dedicated. dedicated this is your own uh, beam you of light. You, you, you buy a 10 gig prop from us, that's 10 gig. Yeah. There's no, what they call it, things like contention. or no contention. Like, well, so, yeah. so that the, 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 the standards, X, XGS porn or whatever, which is 10 gigabits, yeah. you're not getting that because it's split between, there's all sorts right. of other factors at play anyway, but it's split between I see. houses. It's like a tree, yeah? And you're getting one one twig. Yeah. yeah you don't need to dumb it down tree. that much, uh, mate. I was understanding it. It's like, imagine it, if you've got a I little... I thought it was a anyway, word than I'll splitter. I'll, I'll, I'll interject. <laughs> So that's one of the fundamental differences uh, between Vorbos, who, by the way, is from an ownership perspective, we're owned by Octopus, who also own All Points Fiber. So, you know, we're in, oh, this, right. we're, we're okay. in the mix, but we are separate. I didn't know that. One of the key reasons we're separate is because we're a very different architecture with a very different customer base. So that being, be my energy provider being, as well. bi- yeah, being mm. business only Mind and too. being direct internet instead of PON actually puts us in a, in a very dis- different sphere and subject to very different pressure points to the rest of the altnet space mm. which is which is struggling let's not make any yeah. bones about it you know a lot Fucking of the, a lot of the it. capital that came into the altnet space was it, it flooded in when debt was cheap yeah and that's you know really not where we are right now yeah. is no. very, money is very expensive right now um and it's a it's presented a very difficult market. For but I, I wonder who, if who the are chasing homes, the government yeah. uh, interest in that because there was this complaint for a long, long time that we were lagging the rest of Europe on fibre rollout. Very true. And, yeah. and then it became a a bit of a kind of government push to yeah. try and do something about it, both on the regulatory side, which is sort of threatening open reach with and BT with and breakup. That's, that's how PIA came about. Yeah, yeah and, but then on the solution. on the commer- on the more sort of commercial side, it was making it easy, making conditions easier for some of these players to come in that were private yeah. equity backed and do things yeah but i'm I, i'm kind of you know you look at it now i mean most a lot of these players are not going to survive they'll be swallowed up in various rounds of MA, and some of them might just collapse completely but it's yeah. it's 
I wonder how much the market changes. I mean, certainly if you look at some of the numbers from um, what was it? What was the report that came out recently? The Point Topic report that yeah. came out really recently. Yeah. On uh, homes passed by all the alternates put together and how that compares with open reach and what the connections are. You just kind of feel that it might end up being just open reach again and maybe a couple of others who are sort of viable and you know you've got some neighborhoods where you've got sort of five or six fiber lines available to them which is clearly not the reaction of my newish colleague to it when she was looking at the report because yes. i put her on it yeah. Teresa was and I, and I was saying, yeah, it's apparently there's about five or six sort of, um, what, what do they call it? It's not, it's overbuilt, isn't it, is the expression? Overbuilt, yeah. overbuilt lines was that, well, that sounds really efficient, doesn't it? And it's true. It's like that would be the instant reaction of anybody who would think, well, you'd never build two or three train lines next to each other. Although they are kind of doing that with HS2, but that's not exactly going well. Are they? So, well, it's that line. Because there's an existing line and then a whole new one. Line, right, yeah, yeah. They're not going to get rid of. So that's the first time I'm, I'm aware of that there's going to be sort of yeah. par, par, parallel. So, sort of. so let's, you know, you, you referenced earlier, Ian, that, that, that Labour will are talking about musing on, on nationalising the rail industry. I think that's, we could all probably agree that the rail industry failing might be too far, but certainly it isn't excelling. I, don't, I think um, privatisation has not been a huge success story. Not, hasn't there's it? not been a success well, Privatising a natural and monopoly, and that's, even for someone like me, is not a smart move. I agree with you, but fundamentally what there isn't, even in, if you privatise rail, that does not equal competition. Yeah. Because exactly. you don't compete. I want to yeah. go from, you know, um, from Leeds to Manchester. Yeah. There's not, a, there's not five lines offering me Leeds exactly. to Manchester. There's what Different performance yeah. and right? different prices. Exactly. And all that. So, so, so privatisation should, in theory, create the good old market forces should yeah. equal competition. Yeah. Rail is unique in the sense that, and I suppose water as well, so therefore not unique. Yeah. But they're, they're privatised, but the, the, the result was not competition. Yeah. No. In fact, in, they have to manufacture competition by putting stuff up for tender and all that. Absolutely. Thing, and that's full. just to win it, but it is totally yeah, false. Yeah. But in broadband, one, we saw that without competition, we do lag. Open reach, unless actively competed with yeah. has demonstrated historically zero incentive to yeah. invest yeah that's proven yeah. you know 2011 when hyper optic my previous employer launched you know the average speed uh, available to the uk consumer was 6.8 megabits per second yeah. and hyper optic launched a gigabit connection to a block of flats in in uh, wandsworth yeah there's you know that 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 is a, that demonstrates the scale of the problem and open reach has responded brilliantly to competition but I'm maybe that was the, that's to. the thing is that maybe that was the idea yeah to give now, open reach a kick up the, the arse cost yeah. of of Think that so. that cost of inspiring competition is an awful lot of outside investment and an awful lot of jobs an awful lot of new companies that we collectively would probably agree some might fail yeah yeah and I think we'd, we'd have to look at whether or not that was an unintended consequence that we'd be happy with. But, I mean, you're saying, yeah, that was the idea, which is, okay, great, because then if we bring OpenReach along and actually get this uh, the, these lines built by OpenReach, doing its 25 million homes or whatever, then we're, we're, you know, we're on par with the rest of Europe. But if, if, the, if the net result then is in future, it just be, it's just another OpenReach. Maybe it's not a monopoly because I agree there's going to be more competition. But if it's still like a 70% market share or whatever, yeah. it's a market dominated by one provider that might then decide it's going to, after some of this consolidation's happened, that it's going to sit on its laurels again I might and do been, anything. So I might really be talking about problem, something slightly different, sure. which not. is that I just think the way in which OpenReach and BT have been regulated seems to have been quite effective and good in so much as... Uh, getting high-speed lines. But, yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's just put... You know, we had all this... You were probably there at the time. We had all this torturous... You know, is open reach separate from BT or isn't it type of stuff? Yeah, so, so the acquisition of EE happened kind of just after that decision had been made. Right, so that's right. Went but that still it, dragged but... on. I remember doing oh, it, it in this job. Absolutely. And, yeah, yeah. you know, and that wasn't necessarily resolved in a very neat and tidy way. But I think the upshot was to light a fire under open reach's ass. Um, yeah, but where does it, what I'm saying is, where does it get you if at the end of the day, the only surviving player is an open reach yeah, with well, high totally. speed lines that's then not incentivized? No, I'm talking about good as, service, as things so have happened rather than extrapolate yeah. to the yeah. future. So obviously VMO2 would say that they are a very credible second player. Yeah. yeah. And I think we'd all agree that's probably true. Yeah. Um, I think City Fiber to some extent. Certainly once they've converted their... Uh, cable doxis three or whatever it is footprint to full yeah. to full fiber. I think VMOT very credible, and City Fiber would certainly want you to believe the rhetoric that they're the third player. Now they're third at the moment 
by an enormous distance. Yeah, I they're, think the points are people lot, had their numbers in it. They're actually. an awful lot smaller than everybody yeah. than the the two big players, but they're quite a lot bigger than the the one smaller. Yeah, so they're kind of third by default rather than third in, right. a, in a truly credible yeah. way. Um, the third in a Samsung like way. Yes. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Yeah, on in, a, in, in, radio in access networks. networks. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, on which will come. Yeah, so I think you know I don't think you're necessarily wrong to conclude that we might end up in say ten years time, kind of back where we started, but with a much better base layer of infrastructure. And when the next technology evolution happens, there might be there might not be enough meaningful competition to drive the incumbent to do more again. Yeah, that's I think that's a realistic outcome. But I, but I, but I agree I, with Scott. You know, I do believe that the way that BT and OpenReach has been regulated in in recent years has been demonstrably successful. But I, but I think the worry is even before then. I think it's before that 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 phase of next in, because I don't think that there's not going to be one actually for a long time. Once you get the fibre bill, you know, you just need to put new boxes in at each end and increasingly it's operable. Yeah. The, so yeah. so that that's not the issue. The issue for me is. You know, whatever you're doing, you don't want one player in the market because yeah. service levels can drop. Price. I mean, they're regulated. Yes, I get that. But yeah. there's also been some lax regulation, I think, on pricing of OpenReach recently to allow them to kind of do things the way they want to do them, which weren't particularly popular with some of the alternates, including City Fire. Yeah, Equ Equinox, um, what you're referring to. Yeah. Equinox 1 and 2 was not particularly popular yeah. with, with, with oh, City Fire. I remember Fiber. that. That was a pricing um, thing, wasn't so it? It's, yeah, that was the... the yeah. It's, it's almost like a, a to quick pro quo, prices. isn't it? It's That's like right. you know, yeah. we, you've we've we've you've gone ahead and and, yeah. and done your part by committing to build all this stuff, and you've actually gone ahead and done some of it. We'll give you a bit of a, uh, a you know, some leeway on pricing. I get it. I yeah. get. I get the, mm. the which the is always a balance, isn't it? It is yeah. a balance, and it's great that we've got this high speed infrastructure, I suppose, for the future, but. If we've just if we just end up with a market that's kind of that people would say is no different from the rail market because there's really only one provider in most areas. Yeah. By the way, I'm not I'm not saying it will go that way, but there's a bit of a risk of, of it going that yeah. way. I think. I think there's 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 also a comment you made here that you know we're talking this is very inside baseball, right? Because one provider in the market, by which we mean OpenReach, but 99% of consumers out there see a multitude of providers. Yeah. Who all are on open reach. Yeah. Sky they, or they are sort of they are oblivious, rightly and understandably so, to the underlying network. Yeah. But there is price competition from those providers who sit on open reach. Yeah, but you still need to regulate so the price you, of the you, infrastructure uh, at the end the whole, of it. The wholesale, it's still not infrastructure yeah. competition. The wholesale the price needs yeah. to be regulated and yeah. uh, and and the there needs to be a drive to invest in the in the underlying technology. Yeah. I completely agree. Um yeah, Ofcom, I'm sure would 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 welcome your comment, Scott, that they've done a good job of regulating BT. You know, yeah, I'm often I, a dick to Ofcom, would, so they'd I be would, quite happy. I would to... fully agree with it, and I, I but I'd equally, Ian, I share yeah. your concerns at the long term, gonna... medium to long term view. The problem might not be able to be solved. Yeah, mm. yeah. I mean, I think the ideal for me, in a way. Um, would be to have sort of three players, and I think this is probably if you look at Nokia numbers that they've shared sort of publicly. Yeah. It makes sense in a way, actually, that you have you, you need about thirty percent market share to kind of break yeah. even over a period of something like yeah. fourteen years on your fiber investment. Which mm -hmm. a bit beyond that, it starts to become commercially dubious, even for sort of long term yeah. investors. Yeah. So that's like three players basically in the market is what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, we're a long way from three players each having thirty something percent. That's for sure. We are, but that's that would be the the kind of almost yeah. ideal outcome. But but if you have that, the problem that with that yeah. is it's a massive weakening of open reach's position. Absolutely. And it's not as though BT Group doesn't have problems at the moment financially with various other things going on and no. pension but open reach is, and so standalone is in Enormously profitable. Stand, yeah. Standalone. Fair yeah. enough. But BT Group is no. not in not no. in what yeah. you call the best shape and certainly no. not perceived well, to be. Despite the great work of, of, of EE and Co., no, it's not. Yeah. All right, I'm going to butt in because we want to talk about some new stuff and we've only got about half an hour or so left. Also, I'm going to butt in because it's time for Howard to have his, oh. his fourth. Can, can, can we pause it? Can I go to the loop? Yeah, yeah, Desperate, sure. Like, go, all go, the, for it, go for it, Go for it. You can go. So just... Right, yeah. you could just talk about shit now. For a bit. <laughs> well, I, I would normally just power three. If you want to go as well. Go as well yeah, go on then. Sit and get myself uh, enough capacity for that. There we are, for this Monster. bad boy. Okay, we're all yeah. back in room. I've noticed increasingly Rogan now has toilet breaks on his pod, so I think that validates it. Are so we going to keep the toilet break in then? 
No, but there's like obviously going to there's obviously going to be a cut. Like, no, no, he, he turned off the camera, but there's going to be a cut in it. <laughs> and you know, for audio people, they want to know why there's there's been a cut. I'm just being professional, mate. One of us has got to be. No, I just think um, it'd be funny the idea of a five minute toilet break in the middle of a podcast. Yeah. Well, well, if all of you go, the, I have to cut. Yeah. If yeah. one goes, we could probably still go. Yeah, we could just talk some <laughs> shit. Yeah. But anyway, so we've That's done a cut, funny, and now we're back. Me because um, I had a couple of beers. And we're going to just 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 shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> fucking talking over me. We've got half an hour left. I'm trying to do a, a professional transition here, and I just got this gibbering going on to my left. Um, and we're going to move on to some stories. And Howard's got to do his of forfeit course. drink. So this is one. It was actually a long game from my part. I, I deliberately yeah. didn't bring any beers in, yeah, so, you so that I this. could have the legendary. So this is one of the ones that, that Charlie Legends. brought in. In fact, we got to give a shout out to Charlie. Uh, Charlie Ashton, who was on the pod at the start of the year, um, and he was announcing on the pod that he was going to go and walk the Appalachian Trail. And he's done a bunch of it, but he's had to knock it on the head, according to his LinkedIn, because of an injury or something like that. So bad luck, Charlie. Yeah. I'm sure you gave it your best shot. Um, he brought this in. I among... appreciate that, because he, he's a regular listener. So. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. seriously. Uh, and uh, I'm fair play to you for trying it, mate. I wouldn't have the balls to do it. So um, total Good respect. Yeah. Um, and this is one of the things he brought in. It's been sitting there in the box, just sort of <laughs> judging me because I haven't got the balls to drink it. But how I put his hand up. Someone has. <laughs> yeah, and it's called, it's called Hazy Hercules Imperial IPA, and it's 9.5%. Lovely. It's now nice and cold as well, Howard. Yeah, I'll take the edge off. So, uh, yeah, there we are. Uh, right, well, let's see how quickly the... We want the, some uh, feedback on... Let's see how quickly the yeah, content we, we, need a, we need a little review um, before we move on, Howard. OK. Hmm. <coughs> um. Oh, it's... um. Well, y- you know, it... It's wine. It's um, <laughs> it it's <piss>. reminds me. <laughs> it's sort of a hoppier, jazzed up version of Tenant Super Strength. Yeah, well that, that figures. Um, that doesn't sell it well. Can I taste it? Do you oh want no, it? of course not. Uh, no, I don't. I certainly wasn't intending to sell it well. I wouldn't sell it. Is my view. It's not as bad as you it know might what, be, but it's what not our, good. Our mutual friend Richard Fogg would say he'd say it's chewy. Chew, it is a bit chewy. He's, he wouldn't be wrong. It's yeah, it's, chewy. it's a substantial drink. It reminds me of the sort of things I would drink at university with yeah, the yeah. explicit purpose of becoming. Yeah, they very call it like drunk. barley wine. Yeah yeah, 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 which always was a strange name. Um, what was that? There was some, there was a brand of barley wine, but t- Super Tea was definitely one of them. Yeah, tea cider. Yeah, all that sort of stuff. You're probably not going to be like that bloke on the on the on the logo, are you? If you drink no, that's a lot of that's it. a misleading. It would yeah. suggest that it will make me very strong, at, like Hercules, I suppose. Mm. And yeah. I You'll suspect think you that's are. not true. <laughs> exactly. I was going to say it'll yeah. make you think you are. And Ian, we'll we've find had out. To, we've had to go into the reserves. We've got a uh, Ride Pale Ale. <laughs> Uh, and we've got Star. Which of those do you want? You, you, you get to pick. I've that one. Then. I've never okay. had it before. Do you, okay. Give me the choice. You can have some ride. Okay. Um, so we've got two stories we're going to talk about, both of which are ones that Ian has written about. Sorry. Because Ian, um, Ian just writes more. So. Well, cause, yeah, because Ian's just a proper journalist and I just fuck about. Um, but that's fine. At least I admit it. Um, <laughs> that is... That is it's, it's, it's something. It's moody, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, carry on. <laughs> um, uh, but you, you get you get total respect for for Thanks. taking the plunge. Thanks. Um, I think, given that we've been talking about UK operators and given uh, uh, Howard's um, work experience, <laughs> for want of a better word, um, <laughs> about that one. we're gonna we're gonna talk about something you wrote up today uh, this week, Ian, mm. where the headline is. But do you know what? I feel loads more pissed just from having one sip of that fucking yeah, yeah, stuff. Well, yeah. um, it's Seriously. called uh, Vodafone and 3 can cope without merger, says UK regulator. And just to quickly frame it before I hand over to you, Ian, um, the CMA, Competition and Markets Authority, they'd already said they were going to have like a phase two, more in-depth look yeah. at this Vodafone 3 merger. But they this week decided to publish their rationale of it. Yeah. And I, I was going to write it up, and I, I've, I've just found the thing I wrote up instead where I just got on one of my hobby horses about Ofcom and its um, censorship thing. So I ended up just writing something really opinionated about that instead. But I'm also pleased that I didn't write it because I think I was going to write something well, quite superficial. The reason I wrote it is because someone pointed me towards it. He right. said some of it's quite juicy. I won't yeah, say who yeah. that person was, but someone pointed it towards me and said okay. some of it's quite juicy. Well, I'll, I'll, stop, and, I'll stop wittering. You tell us what and you I, found. And I, I wouldn't have written it if... if if, if that had been, flagged that had been up. made clear, but also I think um, you sort of think these reports that are just uh, well, we've done our phase one review and and it's going to go to phase two. 
what's the point? Uh, the phase two, by the way, when they said it's going to phase two, which I think pretty much everybody at everybody Vodafone wrote and that. three expected. That and to everybody happen. wrote it up, right? As though it was uh, yeah, it was, was was written up by everybody. Entirely procedural. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and some of the headlines were quite sort of. Um, uh, you know, sort of like uh, gotcha style headlines. Yeah, like the, yeah. the Sky one was like um, merger in doubt because of okay. pricing concerns or well, something. Well, that's that's the kind of shit lazy journalism we talk yeah, about, spoke yeah. about earlier. Whereas this one is actually almost a justification for saying merger in doubt. Okay, well, because, go on then, tell because us more. Because the, the paper itself, now the paper's really long, and I think maybe this is one of the reasons the paper didn't get covered is because you'd have to have a day to sort of... Yeah. There's not like a convenient executive summary of it either. It's like <laughs> you have to actually kind of make the effort to read quite a lot of it. Yes. I have to confess, I have not read... And the read full paper every, was how long? The full paper is 200, 240 pages. Damn. Now, I got up early, but I did not read the whole didn't 240 that pages. I was quite selective in bits that I read. But the things that a couple of things really stood out for me, and there's a lot I missed. There, there was a lot of discussion of MVNO stuff and various other issues. So I just thought, look, what can I do for a, a story that's still quite kind of a thousand words anyway? And I just picked out a few things, but a couple of things really stood out. One of them is one of the rationales for the merger, the kind of big rationale for the merger, actually, the way they're trying to sell it is there are too many operators in the market, basically. This, this mm. idea that four is too many. You know, the logic's not that hard to follow. You know, everybody's kind of held to quite stringent coverage obligations. But yeah. the smaller operators obviously have fewer cu- fewer customers, so it's much harder for them to I think Boyer at home had another whinge this week about that as well. And, and the, the topic's exactly the same over the yeah, whole yeah. of Europe. The, the, the rationale would be the same. And it, it's and then you look at And then you look at the States, they've got three. You look at China, they've got three. You look at India, they've got three. What, yeah. two and a half? Yeah. And and clearly, you take, take one network out of the equation, you go down from four to three, and there's there's the same number of customers shared between a smaller number of networks, therefore making it easier for you to sort of pay off your substantial capital costs. And even if prices don't change, and they're saying they won't, by the way, that's very much not something that they... Well, they have to, as Howard was saying yeah, earlier. They, they wouldn't say that That would anyway. be a schoolboy error. But, but, even if they want to, they absolutely but, won't. But yeah. even yeah. even if the prices stay the same, even if all, things, all other things stay the same, there's a much better chance of them trying to make a return. And they kind of seized on this report that Ofcom came out within 20 2022 um, on return on capital employed, uh, showing that that was like um, below the weighted average cost of capital, which are kind of metrics used by the financial community. The implication being, if that goes on for a long time, you're just going to stop investing. And they kind of jumped on it because this graph that Ofcom have put together for the years 2019, I think, and 2020, showed that both Vodafone and Three were kind of below whack on ROCE. So it's like this, and they actually bring it up as much as they can, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, the weird thing is, you know, if you'd met Vodafone a few years ago and made any suggestion to them at all that um, their network wasn't quite as good as EE's, they'd have been like, no, we've what done all this. What would they have said, Howard? They'd have been, they'd have been horrified and, and gone on about how wonderful it is. Whereas now you've got this really bizarre yeah, situation where yeah. they're trying to make themselves out to be as shit as they possibly can. Right, because, where, because you, they, you know, then they can play the victim. Even to the extent I noticed where um, three three um, parent company, CK Hutchison, published its results, but obviously threes are within that and they kind of break them out and provide some more detail for journalists. They reported their first operating loss at three UK last year since 2010. And the commentary in the writer by Robert Finnegan, the CEO, is all about it, this shows that we can't possibly be a, a, a single player in all this lot. It's just not sustainable. You know, it has this merger has to go ahead. So it's the just, whole it's just not rationale. The, the thing that re, one of the things that really stood out to me about this data report is the CMA basically just takes issue with all of that. OK. You know, they, they say that they went through internal documents at three and Vodafone that basically contradicted what they'd been told by Vodafone and three in really? their submissions. That yeah. is quite and, uh, and that if the merger didn't happen, that was why I led with the headline that I did. They basically said, and I think I quoted them on it somewhere, that if the merger didn't happen, both the players are sustainable. Now I'm not. I'm not. I know we can dispute this, and we all have our views about going down from four to three. That's what I'm saying. The CMA's position is, yeah. which is that it's not your position. You know, and this, and they also kind of um, wanted to counter that Ofcom, that presentation of this Ofcom report as like a, almost siding with us and putting our position forward. They were very, they were very sort of keen to say yes, but what you didn't mention was that in the Ofcom report they were also saying this is quite normal in a four-player market and. It's whenever when players are pursuing different strategies, it's it's normal for ROC to fluctuate. There was not any mention, by the way, of what happened in 2021, 2022. So Vodafone's UK results are actually quite good recently. That's one interesting thing. Yeah. They've actually now it might be to do with some of these price rises we we're talking about earlier, but the CMA mentions the fact that they're 
um, it losses at one of those measures they use. They use EBITDA and EBIT, don't they? Um, has actually moved back into the kind of positive recently. So there's a lot of stuff they kind of took issue with on this kind of whole basic rationale about return on investment, which I thought was really, really interesting because that really kind of undermines one of the arguments for it. And then the other thing that I kind of looked at quite a lot, which you were talking about earlier, was this sort of network sharing mm. side of things. So th this is really one of the big stumbling blocks to the merger is this. Yeah. There's two big network sharing ventures in the UK. One's MBNL, which yep. is between BT and three, and the other one's Cornerstone, although sometimes people call it Beacon because that's one of the projects, I think, in it. Yeah, it's a bit confusing. CTIL, but, Cornerstone, Beacon. Yeah, but, it's the same, it's yeah, the same kind same, of thing. Yeah, but yeah. and that's that's Vodafone and used to be Vodafone and O2, but it's obviously now Vodafone VMO2. So clearly a merger is gonna have like a foot in either camp. And from what I could, and this is a section I did read more quickly, but the what the, C the, the CMA seems to be concerned about is that they've clearly got a, a, a biggest vested interest in the cornerstone side of things than they do in MBNL. And therefore, they could just basically decide that they're not going to be as committed to MBNL in future and sort of upset things on the investment side. And more importantly than that, maybe, you'd also have this situation where they kind of know what potentially what their competitors are doing so they would be aware of because of their involvement in that in that joint venture they'd be aware of bt's plans to say not build out this is a specific example given not build out a standalone 5g network in a particular area and then go well we were going to but actually as bt is not going to build out a network there we're not going to bother either so I this see. argument about a lot of the the, the, the premise for the uh, merger, actually, one of them is to build out a standalone 5G network and invest all this capital expenditure over the next few years and have it sort of mm. nationwide. It could actually have the opposite effect. But there's a lot in it that was to do with MVNOs. And, That's an extremely pessimistic view. But well, that, that, that yeah. is what I'm... And now, yeah. now, what I would say is, yeah, obviously... Yeah, worst-case scenario thing, the phase, which shouldn't necessarily be the whole basis for the thing. The, the phase one, by the way, having said all of that, that doesn't mean it's not going to happen because the mm. point of the phase one investigation is actually to point out things that could go bad. It's not to sort of say, oh, it's wonderful. Agreed. And so yeah. they're obviously going to draw attention. But I think the... the, the the wording, to my takeaway from it, and I think I put this in my last paragraph, is that it's quite hard now to see it going ahead at least without some quite stringent remedies. Now, maybe everybody expected those anyway, but the companies themselves are certainly pushing for that not to happen. Yeah. And it's hard to see it being allowed without them doing something on the network sharing side. The thing I haven't talked about at all, which I've written about in the past, so I didn't go into it here, but the spectrum side of it is very, very distorted. Clearly, there's a huge amount of C-band spectrum, what the Americans would call C-band yeah. spectrum, in the hands of the the the, the combined entity. Yeah. And there may I know something that kind of upsets the other companies, although to me this less of an issue is the site numbers. But yeah, I don't really kind of get that one as much. But um, yeah. but yeah, I think it's kind of hard to see it going ahead. Depends on the geography with, you're talking uh, about, right? Yeah, and it, the spectrum holders, there, there is more doubt over it, and there's certainly doubt it will go ahead without them doing something quite stringent. I think in terms of remedies. Yeah. What do you think of all that? Had? Gosh, lot to take on. Um, I, I'm quite uh, pleased I got out, that all <clears> out <throat> after about. Three yeah, you did well, mate. You, did, well, you didn't slow once. Exceptional. So um, have some hazy Hercules that will sort you out. First, I would say. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about the CMA calling out the fact that um, returns, you know, basically return on capital expenditure being below cost of capital, being, sorry, being normal, normal in a four-player market, sounds to me like an admission of failure in a four-player market. Yeah. Right? I don't necessarily, you know, okay, I'm, I'm cribbing off your words, and therefore they they might have had some subtleties and nuance in there that that, that changes that position. Yeah. But if ultimately you're saying that no, of course no no player in a four player market can get return on capital expenditure above cost of capital, I would say you have to change the four player market. Well, You've I think got to yeah. go to a three. I think one, really of their, point. one of their and, views is there's obviously that balance <clears> you want to get between. Um, this is the whole Adam Smith thing. You don't yeah. want a monopoly where we were just talking about you where nobody nobody's incentivized to invest, but you don't want so many players that that having Absolutely. you know yeah. that, that nobody can actually make a return. So it's finding the right. Which has come down to that. the four versus three. I, and I guess that's, I think that's what they were trying to get across is that maybe in some ways you could see four as. I mean, I know someone I used to know who worked for the CMA, by the way, 
who I went out for, who I won't name now, but when I went out for a drink with them and talked about this a really long time ago, I, in fact, it wasn't about this deal, it was about the previous one, the O2. The O2, three one, yeah. When I put to him that the companies themselves would say they can't make a return because there's, there's too much competition. And he sort of scoffed at the idea there can be too much competition, which is kind of a mm. normal free market. But it's quite absolutist. But it's but it's kind of a free market economist's reaction in a way to... Uh, t- tell you what, the problem you know, there is that we're combining two things. We're combining free market economics and a highly regulated industry. And yeah. let, let it be one thing or the other. Yeah. You've regulated them to the point where, you know, take the coverage obligations, for example. Yeah. How can how can we, in good faith, say that they are now operating under free market conditions? They're not. Because if they were, then they could choose not to exactly. cover places, and therefore they would be in control of their own economics. And, and can I they say- are demonstrably not in control of their own economics, and therefore for a regulatory power external to this industry to step in and say, um, actually we don't really care that you don't make a return above capital, despite the fact that you're regulated on how to spend your money, I personally find that... I, 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 I take, I, I take umbrage well, with and, that. And, and the you can't have too much competition thing has lots of nuances and problems to it, a lot of which you've already alluded to, Howard, which is, you know, this is an example, a belated opportunity for me to give Pierre his clichéd, I'm a laissez-faire uh, sort of small government type of guys. This is something I say almost every pod now, so it's become a running joke. Um, and yet and yet, it's interesting because a totally unfettered free market in telecoms will probably end up in a monopoly, which is why you need a fucking regulator. Absolutely. Because it would end up in a monopoly. So so what they're actually saying is, what, what your anonymous friend Ian is saying, you can't have too much competition, but he's saying you can't have too much forced competition, and that's different. What... That's the difference between top-down and bottom-up competition. Bottom-up competition is just loads of people like Vorbos, like Hyperoptic, like Giganet, all getting involved, and it's a and it's a total free market bun fight, and and it's Darwin, Darwinian and and the and in theory the most competitive one wins. Totally. But top-down Couldn't competition is where you insist on all these remedies, you insist on splitting companies up, you insist on fabricating competition because from a top-down regulatory point of view you've decided that's good that's a classic example of the dichotomy we have in europe between uh, vestager and breton yeah. where vestagers she positions herself and i'm not saying she's wrong but just to characterize her position uh, in a very reductive way she's pro-consumer so she wants more competition because she knows more competition drives prices down which benefits consumers whereas breton's a bit more pro-business where he's like well let them merge um, and then he'll probably justify it by saying then they'll have more money to invest in networks yeah, but, and all that but, sort of thing. But this is, you, you're sort of, the the idea that you impose a certain number on the market is always going to be a top-down thing. I mean, if you allow yes. the, if the, the market itself, the, the thing that holds the market back and prevents it from being actually more uh, populous than it is in a way is, is the whole spectrum situation yeah, the on the mobile side. The that's the barrier to yeah, entry. Absolutely. And that's why you have a lot of MVNOs. I mean, if, c- c- there would be companies that are prepared to do what something like Rakuten's done even in Japan, I'm sure, at times, at certain times in the investment cycle, maybe not now, but at certain yeah, times yeah, in the yeah, investment yeah. cycle, I you agree. get companies wanting to do that. There have been times in the past when there have been five or six operators in some European markets back in the 3G days. So it's, you know, it's it, 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 you can look at it in different ways. By the way, the point about return on investment that they were when they were going back to the Ofcom report, what the CMA is saying about three's results specifically, because I think three is the one that sort of presents itself as being in more sort of peril and that they're not going to survive. They are sub They are Is that they went into internal documents and found stuff that completely contradicted that and that they had a very long term vision and that they, then their CMA's assessment is essentially this company is sustainable in the long run. And the the other thing I found really interesting, by the way, is the 5G coverage stuff. I was at a press conference in Glasgow uh, with three uh, with I have to be careful how I put this because I don't want to get myself into trouble but Ian Milligan uh, who's the CNO there um, said at the end of 2022 they stopped expanding 5G because the investment demands are too great and they have other things to start to start doing and the figure was about 70, 62% that's an overall figure no mention of indoor and outdoor yeah, okay. by the way the CMA in this report that came out this week puts three on outdoor 5G coverage at 78% and says it's ahead of every other operator in the country. And that's based on their investigation of, you know, 
the, the, the stuff they've been doing over the last few months on phase one. Fascinating. But there's something there that's not quite in alignment. Hey, I'd yeah? say uh, cov- coverage reporting for all that it comes. Coverage via reporting Ofcom, is coverage reporting. I'd say is a is a mixed bag. Well, I think coverage itself is, is a dodgy issue anyway. Yeah. You can put a, a mast up in a town centre and say we've got great coverage, and yet if people get overly congested on it, is it great well, coverage anymore? Well, um, I mean, because it's know. also theoretical, right? That that's the fundamental truth of it. You you know, let's use beer as an example. <laughs> That's I a, like the way you've you, got your you've hazy Jane. Cans that's it. So this far, is a, so. this is a this is a tower. It's hazy Jane, and that's going to provide an amount of coverage based on its height. But my Hercules. hazy Hercules, on the other hand, is going to provide significantly more coverage simply based on its height. Yeah, yeah. It's just that's a, what physics, physics and dictate. Yeah. Now, if this one was to be loaded up with low frequency spectrum as well, it would go even further. So. You know, I, I think co- coverage is an extremely uh, difficult. Bear in mind, there are uh, give or take forty thousand of these sites across the UK. How is any one operator supposed to give such a granular picture mm. to the regulator or to its consumer customers yeah. of the exact coverage picture that it presents? It has to use a mathematical and theoretical model in order to be able to present coverage. And therefore, it's always up for debate. Now, th- th- that said, the discrepancy of circa 10 percentage well, points... Well, the reason what, I said he'll be careful is because, one, it, because um, when Ian said that, he what, just he did just say coverage. He didn't make a distinction between okay. indoor and outdoor. Yeah, so there might um, have been some, so, but, but fair enough. Yeah. Um, wh- where else would you come to? Okay, so I think um, if I get a little bit of colour from my time at, at, at Vodafone... Um, oh, and I was going to ask, by the way, and by the way, we're not going to get onto the final segment because we're nearly out of time. But if, if and what you're saying now, sorry, mate, we're just out of time. Um, if you, I was going to ask you, if you were still at Vodafone and let's say you were the head of comms. Yeah. And they were like, what's our strategy for getting this fucking merger through? That's a horrible so, question. Yeah, yeah. And, and you haven't got time yeah, yeah, to yeah. really give it that. But if you could just I'd bear that in mind while you're saying... writing it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, while, while you're saying what you're going to say. I'll have a think about that. Oh, obviously, um, you can say something that's deliberately superficial because of the well, time... Because I, don't have to, because I don't have to do it. Well, quite. Um, I would say this. Return on capital expenditure is um, a term that you hear at Vodafone a lot. You know, they're, they're highest up corporate comms person in group talks about it extensively it is a driving force for understanding their business challenges um and i think that's important because one it it explains why they were so quick to use the ofcom report from 2022 which articulated it so well but also because it, it it does it does give the reality of the telecom industry extremely well it's an investment heavy industry that requires return and return is really hard to get that said another thing that you said ian um vodafone's recent results unfortunately for them to some extent undermine their woe is me position that yeah. they have to take for in, in the ask for the merger yeah. and that's largely I should have fucked up more largely because um Nick Jeffrey did a phenomenal job in the turnaround CEO role from the bad days of 15, 16, 17 through to 2020, 21 when yeah. he left. He did a phenomenal job turning that company around because it was in a it was in terrible places. It really was. Um, dreadful. Just in terms of like basic like oh, so under investment. Under investment. They'd also made some bad bets in terms of IT changes and right. they'd administered God, I remember those that. very badly. There was a big BSS yeah. a lot problem at one huge stage, wasn't BSS there? issue, yeah. which, which yeah. really yeah. manifested for consumers. It didn't just stay as an industry story. Yeah. This was a dreadful customer experience. Yeah. Nick Jeffrey did a phenomenal job turning it around. Ahmed Essam did a fantastic job carrying on that turnaround. Yeah. And Max Taylor, who, of course, has been recently appointed as um, as UK... CEO and Ahmed's gone on to be a a, a sort of European wide CEO. Really, um, Max has done a fantastic job of growing the consumer segment of the business. So they have been wildly successful Fair enough. from a really really bad place. But yeah. that's meaning but their violin does, is getting smaller. Yeah, exactly. But does that mean that fundamentally um, their argument that they are still sub scale? Does that undermine that position? Certainly at a narrative level, mm. but I, I doubt that it does at a numbers level. I believe they are now making the very best of what they've got, but I don't believe that they are at a scale yet. 
come back to your view, Ian. That oh, it's not my view, by the, the way. No, no, no. Sorry, what you said the about CMA. your your view about oh. the three players in broadband. Oh, You'd right. Three yeah. players now with that, 30, 30 yeah. something, thirty something, thirty yeah. something. Couldn't couldn't disagree. Yeah. Clearly, yeah. that feels good. Yeah. You'd want the same in mobile. Yeah. You know, and but engineering. Uh, that's another matter. Absolutely, but I, you know, as things stand, Vodafone are a long way from that. Yeah. And so I do believe that whilst they have had great results, I, I. I do think they are still technically subscale, and therefore the merger so you, is good good for the industry. Yeah, so you're you're, you're pro the merger. I am, but I was pro the 2015 merger of, of three and 02, and that was kiboshed as well. So who knows? Yeah. Who knows? And were you pro the merger of BT and E when you were there? Because I remember uh, taking the piss out of you. I'll tell going, you. I'll, going, oh, hello, you weren't expecting that, were you? I'll tell you this: um, <laughs> the combined asset value of Orange and T-Mobile was about eight to eight and a half billion. And which are the two companies that went to EE? Which are the two companies that aren't. formed EE. And that happened in 2010 through 2012. In 2016, EE was bought for £12.5 billion. Yeah. I, by the so way, that's a very different am, kind of merger. I am enormously pro that, uh, that, hmm. that acquisition but, because that demonstrated the capability of, t- of taking two plus two and making five. But that's a, that was and, a totally was a tr- different type of merger. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it was. It was and fixed, I, fixed and, I, and mobile. Yeah, it was. And I, that was more akin to VMO2. Yeah, and I think that's almost um, it, yeah. hard. To, I mean, this is one of the reasons, actually, by the way, I don't like it when um, Vodafone and 3 sort of compare themselves to um, <clears throat> to BT and VMO2 because yeah, the big problem different. for them that they've got with v- BT and VMO2 is the only two scale players is yeah. that they are, they're converged in the sense of fixed and mobile Absolutely. operators and that's that's your problem guys I'm afraid that you don't have fixed you could have bought City Fiber and maybe done something with yeah. it potentially you know well I mean okay you're not buying a nationwide telco then and there's a huge amount of investment that would go into that so I'm, I'm being they bought cable and wireless give flip- them that no but that's not, a, but that's not a, that's not a that's not a residential broadband no, provider that's, that's B2B, a b2b in some bits of the country more in Howard space kind of now. Thing. Yeah. so it's yeah. not it's not changed the game for them in terms of broadband no. but so it's not an easy thing i mean i'm being flippant but the problem for them with that they may be talking about addressing with a combined and by the way i'm not against the idea of the merger on you know, i'm sort of presenting the cma argument but what i don't like is when they try and liken it to bte and vmo2 because i think they they're talking sort of apples and oranges yeah, there a little bit to me you know, you're not going to close a gap with with companies that have got fiber assets by merging with another mobile player i'm afraid i completely agree what they are going to going <laughs> to do is is achieve some element of economy of scale Within the mobile industry, they're going to get a, a better, un- undeniably better economy of scale yeah. efficiencies. Yeah, and I think that has to be the the objective. And I think, gen- broadly, remedies aside, I think that's a good thing. Now, if we were to spend a moment on remedies, let's look at they could be Nick, Nick Reed's departure from as Vodafone Group CEO. It was deemed he had not done enough yeah. on the M and A side to sustain his position. He was under pressure. Which I think, incidentally, I think there's a lot of weird wankiness that happens at, at, at the CEO level of public companies where they've got to be seen to be doing these eye-catching M&A. And sometimes, why not just be a good custodian and, and not create waves? Do, do you know what? I, I don't disagree with that statement at all. But in the case of Vodafone, I think activity was okay, needed. Now, enough. they were under pressure from some activist investors and some... Um, institutional investors that were quite active. <laughs> um, they were under pressure. They needed to demonstrate uh, some M&A activity. Margarita Delvel has been brought in. She's she's done the Italy deal. We think is is done. If not, if, if it's not done, it's very yeah, close. Yeah. It's, it's agreed by um, shareholders. You know, I, don't, I don't know if it's gone um, through the regulatory. Yeah, things, but, it'll, but but we're assuming yeah, it's yeah. done. Maybe their Venetian coverage will improve. <laughs> I, I guess. I guess the point I'd make is we all expect there to be remedies of the three. Vodafone deal. What is Vodafone's stomach for those remedies? My position would yeah. be it's probably a lot more than we might expect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because they're I they're pretty desperate for it to go through, aren't they? They will. They will stomach a lot. Yeah. And our boss Stephen Carter is on the is a non-exec well, director. He'll he'll be giving us some th- pragmatic advice. If it doesn't go through, they have to explain that they're not actually that shit after all. That's the big Quite. problem for them. Yeah. And fair play to them. They've never, that's, that's the, they've never compromised. The PR their, challenge yeah, they've never afterwards. compromised their position with, from a, from a consumer perspective. No, I mean I don't think most consumers have been paying attention mm-hmm. to this. And yeah, they've yeah, geared but... themselves up for it to go through. You know, by moving Max Taylor into the UK CEO role, they have geared themselves up for it to go through. He is 
he has enormous experience of integration work from being part a senior member of the EE to BT team. Um, he he will lead a, a combined Vodafone three. It would be very consumer centric, although he has a lot of B two B experience. That plays to the strengths of the organisation very well. I think okay. I think I think they're positioning themselves very well for it to go through, and I All think right. they'll stomach a lot. We we got to wrap it up because Pierre's got a meeting in two minutes. I want it to go through. Howard wants it to go through. Do you want it to go through? No, I want to get my phone service for fifteen pounds a month, don't I? Right. Okay. Well, two one. So you still lost. So fuck off. Right. Um, on that note. I will say thanks a lot, Howard. That was great. No, thank you, you. You've done a great thanks job of um, having your forfeit beer there. It's nearly all gone. I don't know what kind of a state you're going to be in. I don't know if I can stand up <laughs> or <laughs> or feel my face, but we'll you've find well. we'll you've, find you've, out. You've, you've, we'll you've find drunk out. it. You've drunk it like a yeah. fucking trooper. Thank I'm you. proud of you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, that's great. We better stop. So thanks a lot for listening, and make sure you join us for the next one.